bit of um, oldish people. Um, and uh, we don't know if they're able to plan a future for the people to whom the future belongs. And that's why deliberately today, we brought a youngish person to come and discuss what the expectations of government is. Mr. Farouk Abbas is no visitor to this program. I think it's about the third time he might be coming here and speaks of his eloquence, his knowledge, his capacity, his depth, and his love for Nigeria. He's a lawyer by training, specializing in commercial litigation, labor and employment law, property law, debt recovery, and ADR resolution, and so on and so forth. It's no visitor to this program. And um, he's been practicing law for quite a few years. Not only that, he's also a politician to some extent, having run for office in his uh, local state of Osho State uh, at different times, and was or is a member of the PDP. Uh, he's also appeared on various fora, uh, channels, TV, Wazobia, Top FM, so on and so forth, speaking on his favorite topic, our nation, Nigeria. Oga Farouk, let me welcome you warmly once again to your home. And this is indeed your home. And uh, you are quite conversant with Nigeria uh, and with what is going on in Nigeria. And you represent a breed of generation that people like us admire. The new government has come in right now, sworn in uh, in the morning of Monday the 29th. First of all, let me ask you, and you can dodge the question if you want, what was your opinion of the elections? How did the elections go? Is the, the, are the outcomes what you expected? And was the INEC performance along the lines of what you expected? And are you satisfied with the outcomes? Good evening, Pastor. It's a pleasure to see you after a couple of months. And good evening, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here. Always a pleasure to be here. And like you rightly said, this is indeed my home as I feel comfortable in this gathering. And I always enjoy the conversation that we have from time to time. So regarding your questions, I'm not one who does this question. I like to, I mean, I, don't, I like to be very straightforward and blunt on issues. So number one, was I satisfied with the outcome of the elections? No, I wasn't satisfied with the outcome of the elections. And um, the reason why I wasn't satisfied is that um, we did an election in Oshun State. We had a governorship election in Oshun State just last year, a couple of months before the presidential elections. And it was very smooth. Um, transmission was done from the polling unit. We didn't have any issues. On the day of the election, we were already aware of who the winner of the election was. And largely, there was no major complaints. Even when the other party who lost the election went to the tribunal, the issues they raised didn't pertain to what took place on the election. It was some technical arguments they brought in and the Supreme Court um, addressed that point. So with regards to the presidential election, INEC raised Nigerians' hopes very high. We had expected that results would be transmitted almost immediately, even though the Supreme Court had said in the Oyetola and Adeleke case that it is not mandatory to transmit election, the results of the election on the day the election took place or whilst the election is going on. I feel that INEC told us that they were going to transmit the elections immediately. In some places, there were voter suppression. In some places in Lagos, some people wanted to vote and they did not allow them to vote. There was violence in one or two places. So that was demoralizing. I didn't like that part of the, of the, of the election. But you know, elections, we keep improving every, every year. I feel that the election is still an improvement from what we've had in the past in terms of the deployment of the beavers. There was still vote buying, but it wasn't as rampant as we had in the past because uh, like in my own, I can speak for one, my own state where I voted in Oshun State. In the past, you will have seen money flying around and all that. But in this particular election, perhaps due to the um, the Naira policy that there was no Naira in circulation, politicians didn't have access to Naira directly. Although some of them were creative in the sense that they were sharing spaghetti, semovita, and Ankara and all that. But you know that was a bit reduced. Violence and ballot snatching too. Was snatching was also reduced. But following the procedure. It wasn't, it wasn't really, it's not the best, given the amount of money that was budgeted, all the town hall meetings INEC had. The expectation of Nigeria was that Nigerians was that on the day of election, we'll go to the IRF portal 
we'll see our results immediately. Even though the INEC eventually uploaded the results at a later date, that still affected the, the trust that Nigerians have in the system. So a lot of Nigerians are dissatisfied with the results. But in terms of the results of the election itself, in terms of um, the numbers that we had, I think is a fair representation of what actually happened based on those who voted. Of course, it's a known fact that I didn't vote for APC. I voted for Atiku. I wanted the PDP to win the election. Unfortunately, we didn't win the election. But as a lawyer, as a law-abiding citizen, I accept the results. But I know that the election was not the best that we could, we could, have, we could have had. And I hope that um, INEC will learn from the experience. We have some elections later this year in Imo. I think we have in Edo and we have in Kogi State. I hope that INEC will copy the same template they use for Oshun State. Because in Oshun State, we didn't have any issues. It was a smooth election and um, it went very peaceful. The results were transmitted immediately. They came to the ballot, the polling units immediately. There was no voter suppression. There was no ballot boxing snatching. Nobody was killed. Nobody was harassed. No traditional ruler prevented people from voting and all of that. So it's not an election that we should be proud of as a nation, but um, it just goes to show that. And that's one of the things the, gov the new government will need to do. You need to allow Nigerians have trust in the in the in the system, in the electoral system. As it is now, majority of the youths are not satisfied with the election. Some people don't even believe that um, they recognize the president that um, we have because they are so decent. On the on the day of the inauguration, I made a post praying for the president on my Facebook status, and some people came to attack me and were saying that why will I be praying for the president and all that? So the youths are not happy. And they have a good reason not to be happy because if it was fully transparent, if there were no issues, nobody would be dissatisfied. We would, have, we would accept the election easily. So there's an issue of legitimacy. There's an issue of legitimacy. We can't really say um, there is legitimacy as far as, the government is, as far as the government is concerned. And also, given the percentage of the, of the winner, the president won by about 36.6%. That's a negligible percentage of the people who voted in an election. So it's very clear that in terms of majority of Nigerians, majority of the youth, this is not their option. So if you ask the average Nigerian, you are sure that the logical answer to the question is that majority of Nigerians will certainly not be satisfied with the election because if you aggregate the numbers together, you will see that majority did not vote for who won the election. But as citizens, law-abiding citizens, we have to accept the results. So I don't know, Pastor, if I answered the question very well or if I missed out any aspect of the question. Well, you've tried your best and uh, we'll accept that answer for now. Uh, two questions uh, going further. Your party is now in power in uh, Ocean State. So are you part of this government? Are you offering them service? Are you going to be there? Uh, and so on and so forth. Are you going to run for any office soon? And then question number two, the president or the INEC and all the people have been taken to court by your party, PDP, and also by the Labour Party. Uh, as a lawyer, can you look into the um, crystal ball and tell us what you think the outcomes will be? Okay, thank you, Pastor, for the question. <laughs> These are very tough ones. Yes, you're correct that um, PDP is now the ruling party in Washington State. Um, being on this call, I see it as a form of service to Nigerians because we are speaking and we are trying to make ourselves available and um, encourage more Nigerians to show interest in, in the election process. And part of the reason why the, the, the only good thing I took away from the 20, 2023 election is that a lot of Nigerian youths were participating in the campaign process. It has never happened before in the history of Nigeria. That's a population that ordinarily they will have been watching African Magic or Big Brother Nigeria or Premier League or what have you. But these youths came together, they spent their money, they spent their resources, they were talking about the campaigns, they were following the elections very well. So we were able to bring in a lot of people into the ecosystem politically, and that's the good news for Nigeria. Although we didn't achieve the results they wanted, but the fact that they are even talking about the election, the fact that they are not satisfied, if it was in the past and they rigged an election, the youth would not even be talking about it, nobody would be complaining. But the mere fact that a political party could even bring an application in the court asking for the um, the proceedings to be showed live on air, it, it means that the political party has gotten a feedback from its supporters that we want to know what is going on in the courts. We are interested in the process. So that alone is good news for Nigeria. And even if the results that we got at the election did not favor the youths on who they wanted, I will tell them not to give up. If you look at the result of Abia State governorship election and Kano State governorship election, Alex Oti ran in 2015. 
He was believed to have won, but he, 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 was, he, he wasn't declared as a winner. He won at the Court of Appeal, but the Supreme Court upturned it. And he, he, didn't, he didn't keep quiet. He kept on participating in politics. In 2019, he ran again. He didn't win. He didn't give up. In 2023, he won. He ran, and he won. In Kano State, Abba Yusuf ran under PDP in 2019. He was believed to have won the election, but it wasn't announced. In 2023, he won, and it was announced. Even the current occupant of the office has been in politics since he was 40 years old, and now, according to official record, he's 71 years old. So that means he's been in the game for about 40 years or thereabouts, or 30, 31 years or thereabouts. So he spent time. President Muhammad Bari too spent a lot of time before he came into office. So politics is not a game that you just come from. You just wake up one day and say you want to turn the apple cart or you want to come and win an office. These Nigerian politicians, they are one of the smartest people in the world. Unfortunately. They don't use their smartness and brilliance for governance. They just use it for politicking because they plan five years ahead, 10 years ahead, and they take all that. To answer your question, whether I'll be part of the government in Oshun State, the government has just been formed. Um, the inauguration, the House of Assembly will be inaugurated on, on Tuesday, June 6th. Um, I will be willing to contribute my own quota to the development of the state, especially my community where I come from and my local government. But we cannot force ourselves on the government. If they feel that they need our services or they need us to participate in governance, whatever they give us, we'll consider it and we'll see if it's something that we can be beneficial because there's no point accepting to be part of a government where you know you cannot perform or where you're going to soil your name or soil your reputation. So all cards are on the table. The fact that we are involved in the political process shows that we are willing to contribute one way or the other, but it's left to the governor and his team to decide if they want us. If they don't want us, thankfully, we have a job, we have a second address. So it's not a do that. We will continue to serve the country in any other way, including coming on this platform, um, volunteering for ALG um, activities and other, other, other organizations. So we are willing, but we'll consider in a way that will not affect our reputation, our religion, our faith, our family, and our name and all we stand for. That's the first, um, that's the first question. I've answered the first question. The second question, in terms of the crystal ball, um, looking at the case um, at, the, at, the, at the presidential tribunal, ordinarily as lawyers, we're not supposed to talk about cases in court, but as citizens, there's something called fair comment. We can talk about what are our expectations? What do we see from what is going on? Because any day they have a hearing in the court, they report it on the news. Yesterday was on the news that they adjourned the case because some people brought some document or a witness was not available. So this goes to show that we can comment on what is happening, but we can't say this person will win or this person won't win. In my own view, on the issue of um, one of the strong grounds, I'll talk about the petitions one after the other. Like for, for Labour Party, one of the grounds on which their case lies is the issue of um, the FCT, not winning the FCT. Strongly, personally, as I believe in a literal interpretation of the law. And I've discussed this with several lawyers, including, including lawyers who work for APC and the PDP, that personally is an interesting argument. And I believe that you should win the FCT before you, should, before you can be declared as a president. That's my own belief as a lawyer my own interpretation. Some other people have said that it's not a logical conclusion. It's not a log logical interpretation. It doesn't make sense. What if you win all these states and you don't win Abuja? But personally, I feel that's an interesting point. And the point cannot be waved aside as an irrelevant point. So it's a point that I want to see how the Supreme Court will rule on. If the majority of the members of the panel believe in my own position or in Labour Party's position, then we know what that, what that will mean on the election. But if they don't agree with that, then we look at the other points regarding um, the, the units, not somebody not scoring majority of the votes. It's all about evidence. In the Adeleke case, which is the latest case from the Supreme Court on Beavers on the 2023 election, because every other election petition we've had, apart from, apart from um, AKT State, they were based on the old Electoral Act. So the Adeleke case and the AKT governorship election case are the cases that we can use as templates, as guide for what will happen at the Supreme Court. And what the Supreme Court has said in Adeleke case is that for you to prove that there was overvoting or there was undervoting or there was manipulation, you need the voters register as evidence, you need the beavers report, and you need, you need the beavers machine, you need the voters register, and you need to show um, where they did not comply with, with the law. So if any of the petitioners, including PDP or Labour Party, feel that somebody did not get a vote in a particular area or the votes were manipulated, so long as you bring the voters register from that unit, provide the beavers machine from that unit and you are able to show clearly that the votes there was there's discrepancy in it then of course the court will give you judgment you know should states what happened was they did not bring the beavers machine they only relied on the server reports and the INEC and the supreme court held that server reports goes to no issue so law is a matter of evidence 
If you say that the election was not properly held in a particular area or did not comply with the electoral guidelines and the INEC, INEC Act, bring your documents to support it. Once you are able to achieve that and your forensic experts look at it and they see that you have a case, of course, yes, we have a case. But as lawyers, we can't just say there's no case. We have won. Therefore, because we are in government now, we'll use the power of the, of the presidency to intimidate the child. You can't do that. In a, you can't do that. Nigerians are so interested. The judgment must be fair, must be balanced, and must be just. And I'm sure that the Supreme Court will not toy with the future of this country. So I feel that it's an interesting case. And it, it, there's, there's, there's a lot that can come out from that case. I will not show it aside and say, ah, once you've inaugurated the president, then it's a damp squib. The horse has bolted from this table. Nothing can happen again. No, I don't see it. In, I don't see it. In, I don't see it in that, in that light. And which is why when PDP, PDP's lawyers tendered out some documents yesterday, APC challenged the admissibility of those documents, saying that they will give their reason in their final address. So if they felt that their case is a straightforward case and they don't have anything, they don't have anything to lose, allow all the documents to go in. Don't challenge the documents. You can just say you can rest your case and say they've not achieved, they've not proven it. Because in election petition, the petitioner must establish his case first before the onus will shift to the respondents. Where the petitioner fails to establish his case, the, the respondent does not have any job to do. All he needs to do is just to be having fun and smiling in court. But the APC lawyer, they have a very formidable team. The way they, they came about with their team, you know that they mean business and they know there's fire on the mountain. So I feel that this is not a case that can just be waved aside with a shove of the hand and feel that nothing good can come out of it. I feel that whichever way, they are going to make some very, very fundamental pronouncements and anything can happen because we have brilliant lawyers. The lawyer we use in Ocean State is one of the lawyers on Peter Obi's legal team. And if you talk about brilliance, he's one of the most brilliant lawyers that, that we have in Nigeria. He's very, he's very, very thorough, articulate, and he handled a delicate case. And as far as today, as, as of today, the latest authority on beavers on election in Nigeria is the Adeleke case. So if a lawyer handled the Adeleke case, you are, you are very sure that he won't make the kind of mistakes that some other people made in his case that is going on now. So I feel that it's, it's, a, very, it's a very, very tough case and um, we should be expectant. Anything can happen. As lawyers, you, you never give your clients assurances that you have, even the case that you feel is sure for you, you must never tell your client that, don't worry, I'll get you judgment in this case. It's only a lawyer who doesn't know what he's doing who will assure his client that I will win this case for you. So as far as that goes, I believe that um, the case is, a, is, a, is an interesting one and we will expect a lot of fireworks from the proceedings. Okay, so let's be looking at the space. Marcella seems to agree with you. I see her nodding her head, saying that you'll be expecting fire, <laughs> fire, <laughs> fireworks from the case. That's very good. Let's now go to the meat of our discussion. What our expectations from this uh, administration, what would you be expecting? You know, the president Inumbu very well, at least you know of him by reputation, if you don't know him personally, and so on and so forth. What, well, first of all, uh, Ceteros Paribus, all things being equal, what should a new administration be focusing on in our country? And then underline that or laying that on top of, you now know the Tinubu team, yeah. Um, uh, and objectively, his antecedents and things like that, how do you think his administration will fare? Okay, thank you very much, Pastor, for the question. Um, yes, you, you, judge, you judge a man by his antecedents, by his actions in the past. That's how you can assess people's character and their personality and their philosophy. And going by the antecedents of the president, when he was the governor of Lagos State, he had one of the most fantastic team. A lot of his commissioners, we remember them with fond memories. I remember a lot of his commissioners. I know a lot of his commissioners. Other governments, we can't even remember their names because they didn't really make significant impact. So if we go by that record, I expect that it would live up to the expectation of surrounding himself with very brilliant eggheads, very brilliant brains. With the kind of feats he achieved, even as the governor of Lagos State, you would expect that you know that he has a very good team advising him. The way he ran his campaign, the scientific and the forensic manner in which they took the campaign, you know that he has a very brilliant team working for him. So I expect that um, we would have round pegs in round hole. I expect that he, should, he will go after the best that we have in this country, regardless of their religion, their ethnicity, and um, their political affiliations, and bring them into his government. He has been touted as someone who likes to attract talents, who likes to attract brilliant people, who has a forgiving spirit. 
So I expect that um, regardless of um, whatever anybody must have said during the campaign, whatever anybody might have said on any program, once he knows this person is the person for the job, I expect him to bring the person in to serve in his cabinet. Another thing I expect from him is that unlike the last administration that we had, where no minister was fired for underperformance, where nobody was queried, where we didn't have any sort of KPIs performance index on the performance of the ministers to assess their job, where most of them, we can't even remember their names. I'm not sure I can mention five or six ministers in this government, in the last government, but I can tell you about 10 or 15 ministers in um, Obasanjo's government. So I expect that even when he appoints his ministers and they don't live up to expectation, I expect that he will fire them if the need arises. And I expect that it would it would bring in it would bring it would bring in it would bring in the right team. So in terms of team, I expect a very formidable team. And the major thing I expect from him as the president, number one, is that legitimacy. The question of legitimacy is very paramount. Is in quotes. His legitimacy is not so solid. And how do you win that legitimacy? You need the trust of the youth. The youths form about sixty-five percent of the population in Nigeria. Most of them are disenchanted with the system, governance and political structure. They are very angry with the, with the few that we don't need a president who is over 70 years old. They have their own idea of the kind of leader that they need. So he needs to disappoint those youths. He needs to disappoint us and let us know that, you know what, you guys thought I'm not good for this job, but I'm the best. How will he do that? He needs to empower lots of youths. He needs to attract the best youths. We don't just want youths to become photographers to the president and the vice president. The only time we hear youth getting appointments is when they are appointed as special photographer to the president or when they are appointed as SA on digital media, you know, all those or PA or small, small positions that are not, they are not, they are not, they are not, they are not um, significant positions. So we need a youth as ministers. We need youth as um, head of government agencies. And you can, you can take a cue from some leaders in this party. Governor Nasser Rarifai, we don't belong to the same political party, but he's a very brilliant governor. He performed excellently well, regardless of your political, your, your political affiliation or your religion. If you see a pretty lady, it's a matter of fact that she's pretty. If you see a brilliant person, a brilliant pastor, even if you are not a Christian, I know Pastor Igodalo is a brilliant pastor because he knows so much. I know you were talking. I knew you were talking about me. I knew you had to be talking. Do you understand? So, so we know that. So let's go for the youth. And if you want to empower youth, don't go and empower the child of a chieftain of your party or the, ch the children of your friends and say you are empowering youth. In Lagos State, when we had the election, you can't just mention, if you say, okay, which youth have you empowered? Don't just tell us, go and pick youths that you don't have affiliations with. Ask leaders to recommend for you. There are youths making ways in, when we're talking about Ministry of Communication, the youths are the ones who know about communication, who know about technology, technology who know about fintech. Appoint a very smart youth into, into, into government. Even Ashwa Dibola I mentioned, when he ran for Senate in 20, 1991, he was 40 years old. So if he could be a senator when he was 40 years old, why can't he appoint a minister who is 37 years old, who is 35 years old, who is 39 years old? So he, he needs to attract the youth. When he attracts the youth and invite them to the table and communicate with them regularly, we need to have a governance structure whereby the president, just like we have in America where you do press briefings regularly, he needs to be giving us press briefing. We don't like to read press statements from signed by a spokesperson every time. We need to hear from our president. Let him communicate with us. Governor Samuel, look, he got, the, he, got, he, he got the memo during the last governorship election. He started going up and down. He started going to buy ice cream in supermarket. He was going to churches. He was mixing with the youth in where they play, in where they walk, in where they stay, do their things. So the president needs to come down from his eye horse. He needs to engage the youth directly. He shouldn't say Twitter is a toxic space. I don't want to go to social media because if you go there, they will say rubbish and they will say what I don't like. No, that's their space. You need to get their trust. How do you get that trust? Invite them to governance address their concerns. A lot of lawyers are leaving, going to Canada. A lot of doctors are going to Canada. They are not happy with their system. Nobody wants to be a second class citizen anywhere. So if anybody is thinking of relocating abroad now, it's because they are not satisfied with their country. So make them satisfied with the country. If you tell us that there is no money in government, you can't be maintaining the presidential fleet of 10 aircrafts and you're telling us there is no money and you are driving the latest 2023 Lexus. I, I see a lot of governors driving the latest Lexus, the latest G-Wagons, and you are saying there's no money, you cannot pay pension. If there's no money, drive 504. Drive Toyota Corolla. If I see a governor driving a Toyota Corolla or driving a small car, then we can sympathize with you and say, oh, it is correct that this one does not have money. But you are living a luxurious life. Your children are traveling, traveling everywhere. You are going for parties. You are enjoying yourself. And you are telling Nigerians that there's no money and the economy is bad. They won't believe you. So he needs, to, he, needs to, he needs to develop that trust between himself and the youths and Nigerians. That's the first thing I think he needs to address. The second thing I, need to, I think he needs to address is that the election that we've just had, 
we have identified some places where there was voter suppression, where some, some INEC officials misbehaved, where someone did not have the power to announce a result, announce the result. Let them be arrested, prosecuted, investigated, and sent to jail. Let him pass that message across so that by November, when we're having the new governorship elections, Nigerians and INEC officials will see that if you try to suppress any votes, you'll be jailed, you'll be arrested. So now we've done the election. We are not hearing anything about what happened in Adamawa anymore. What happened in Lagos, where some people were attacked. We are not hearing it. Who are the people that attacked them? Who are the people that were arrested? What is the state of their case? Let him be giving us reports on a daily basis. And again, he said, being the president is his life ambition. Emilio Kong, if something is your life ambition, we expect that within 30 days, you should announce your ministerial list. By today, we should know your chief of staff, your SSG, the critical positions, because you said this is your life ambition. In your life ambition, like now, I have dreams of what I want to do. There are some things that when they happen now, I won't think twice. I know who is going to work with me because I know my team already. You know, so we should start seeing that sense of urgency. Yes, he has started very well. He delivered a very nice speech. He addressed the right issues. He has had meetings today with the um, security people. Last yesterday, I think he met with um, um, NNPC and CBN. The dispute between DSS and, EF and EFCC is he waited in immediately, unlike in the past where the president might not say anything about it. You know, so he needs to he needs to earn that he needs to earn their trust. Another thing he needs to do again is that he needs to focus on the issue of power. Power drives every economy, so he needs to try to see how we can resolve the issue of power. And I mean, in some areas in Lagos, we have almost twenty hours lights in Magodo, in some other places in Lekki, we have private um, private arrangement and all that, you know. So it means that these things are doable. So let him address power, let him address security. Once there's power and security, then the economy will improve and there'll be prosperity. If there's prosperity, there'll be less grumbling, there'll be less, there'll be less arguments, there'll be less agitation, ag agitation. The children, the, the youth who are making noise on social media, they will reduce their noise making because their life will be comfortable and all that. So if we can, if, if we can address some of these issues, then, then I think, I think, I think um, it, 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 it will do very well and um, it would enjoy his presidency. But as a matter of urgency, the youths have gone beyond being photographers to president and essay on digital media. If he doesn't appoint solid youths into his government, I can, in his government, I can assure you that within one year, he will feel the heat from the kitchen and the heat will be unprecedented. The heat will be unprecedented. So the only way to quell the heat is to make life comfortable for the youths, make them have a sense of belonging. Leadership now is not all about autocracy. It's about you inspire followership, you inspire leadership. You can't just command and give authority. Even as leaders in our offices, we can't just be giving orders. Five-year-old children will question you. This generation, Generation Z, they are very, they are very confident. They, they can attack you. They can ask you questions without caring whatever you feel. So he needs to come down from his us and not see them as toxic. Even I have issues with some of the Generation Z or whatever it is they call, they call them, you know. So we have to learn and change how we interact with them and get them to our side because their energy is so strong and is very contagious. So that energy, we need to channel it into development, channel it into economy, channel it for the good of the country. But if you leave them to be disgruntled, eventually they'll come for us and we might not have anywhere to hide. Thank you very, very much. So um, maybe I can recap. You think that uh, President Tinubu will put together a good team. You think that uh, he will react promptly to certain things. You are hoping that based on his uh, ambition, this being a lifelong ambition, he will hit the ground running and he'll be able to tell us where exactly he's going. Uh, uh, well, let's hope that these things will be fulfilled. And you have suggested that he really needs to reach across the table uh, to the youth and uh, make sure he gets the youth uh, on the ball and engaged and moving. Uh, but do you think he's going to be able to tackle this issue of corruption and this issue of power in Nigeria? Yes, the issue of power, I believe strongly. I believe strongly that he will be able to tackle the issue of power. Because if I recall clearly, when he was the governor of Lagos State, he wanted to have the Enron Power Project or something of that sort, and the federal government stifled that project. And one thing we can't take away from Tinubu is that he's a, he's a, he, 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 he has vision. So a core Atlantic project, look at the Dangote refinery, you know, he, look at the way he increased the IGR, look at the Oracle system he brought into Lagos State Civil Service, you know, he has ideas, he gets ideas from people. So I believe that the issue of power is an issue because when he was in, in governor of Lagos State, he was fighting the federal government. He was always in court with Obasanjo on federal federalism issues. So now that you are the president now, you must prove, us, prove to us that your fight then was not a selfish one, wasn't one to just propel your own ambition or to propel your name. Now that you are the president, 
all the things you were fighting against Obasanjo for devolution of power, you must implement them. So I'm very convinced that it would address the issue of power because the issue of power is a money-making venture. And one thing I know about the president is that he likes where money can be made, where he likes, he believes in prosperity as an accountant. So when you address the issue of power, you are not really doing Nigerians a favor. You are bringing in new business people who will make money and he already has the network and the resources. So I believe it will handle the issue of power. The second issue you mentioned is the issue of security. I once attended a lecture where um, um, Sanusi, Professor Sanusi Lamido, SLS, the former Emir of Kano, said, and I think Pastor Suisu, you have also mentioned it to, the, to me when I was visited the house some, some, some months back. You said, you mentioned that we don't really need that. If we have a government that is spending 95% or 90% of the revenue on Nigerians, and we can see the impact, that is still good. If they are taking 5%, well, we can overlook it because they are spending 95% of the people on the, on the people. But what we have currently is that they are practically spending 75% on themselves and spending 10% on, 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 on Nigerians. So I think it can also tackle the issue of corruption because if it tackles the issue of corruption, that will give the government more money to be able to achieve its ambition. Now the government is almost prostrate. They are in debt. They don't have money. So it's in his own best interest. If he's tackling corruption, it won't be tackling corruption because he's a saint or because he believes so much in um, cor anti-corruption drive. He will be tackling corruption with a view to getting more money for the government so that he can achieve his own project. Because he has told us when he did his inauguration dinner that don't pity me, I asked for this job. So knowing the kind of experience I have, I know that a Tinubu will block the leakages. Where people were stealing money in certain ministry, I know we will block those leakages so that he can have more money to operate. So whether or not it will, they will now use 100% of that money for Nigerians is not a question I can answer. But I know they will address the issue, they will block it, and they will have more money on ground. So the kind of TV that we had in the past where even agencies that ought to be generating several billions were not generate, are not generating money won't happen again. When we had um, Professor Isaac Oloyede as the, as the DG of, um, uh, of JAMB, that was when JAMB started remitting money to, 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 to the coffers, federal government coffers. In the past, JAM never used to remit any money. And we have several agencies like that. I read this lady's book, Adiza Bala Usman, the former MD of NPA. And she talked about her experience in NPA. When she came in, she tried to block some, some leakages and she also generated more revenue. So what this goes to show is that if you appoint the right set of people into government position, they will, they will block the leakages. But if you appoint people that will say they don't know anything about the ministry as the minister and all those things, you might not get the best because the people who know about that ministry will play games and, and, and carry out corruption. But if you appoint someone who knows about it, he will know where the, where, where the dead bodies are buried. And the first thing they will go to, he will go and block that place. So I believe that um, Ashiwaju Bola Ametinu will work on addressing corruption just to save his own government and to be able to have more money to achieve his objectives for the country. Okay, very good. I'll just take a few more questions and then probably hand it over to Pastor Sonny uh, and maybe Jim Oke to take the questions and answers. And my question is this, um, are there any other areas from your own perspective that you think uh, this new government should be looking at? That's number one. Number two, uh, are there people you think he should appoint into his government? Would you to recommend a list of ministers and so on and so forth uh, if you are given the privilege, you may not recommend everybody, but at least three, four, five, six, seven, eight people uh, uh, from your thinking and scope, including some young people that you think you should bring on board. That's apart from Farouk Abbas, of course. Uh, but, uh... <laughs> I won't recommend myself. I won't recommend myself, sir. But I, have names. I can recommend to you. Well, for Attorney General of the Federation. Attorney, Don't worry. Attorney, I'll, I'll recommend you and I'll recommend Bambo. So, uh... <laughs> for, for Attorney General of the Federation, Farouk, I would like a commercial we lawyer. Want Farouk, I would like a we want Farouk. We no, want Farouk. No, 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 for Attorney General of the Federation, I would like a commercial lawyer. Why do I say commercial lawyer? Commercial lawyers are business oriented. They know the value of time. They know how to achieve results. I would prefer someone like a Candy Johnson, Yemi Candy Johnson, or a person like um, um, Bolawan Elias. Candy Johnson or Bolawan Elias, those two for Attorney General, they are no nonsense people. And why I mentioned Attorney General first is that rule of law is the bedrock of any sane society. When you have a sound Attorney General, it will not mislead the president. Part of the problems our past presidents have had in the past is that when they go to their AGs for advice, they don't usually get the best advice that are in the interest of Nigerians. 
if you have a commercial attorney general, like, you know, um, Prince Bola Ajibola was once an attorney general. And when he was the attorney general, he appointed um, Professor Yemi Oshibadu as a special advisor. And we know what they achieved. When you appoint people who are grounded in their profession, who know what they are doing, they will perform very well. And when there's rule of law in an economy, investors will come. I attended a conference today and they were telling us, the DG of the Stock Exchange was telling us today that for the past eight years, we have been getting outflow of foreign investment from Nigeria. But with the new government, we are hoping that we'll get inflow. So people were taking their money out because they were not sure of the rule of law system. So if you see that you have an, an attorney general who is well-respected in the business circle, because commercial lawyers do a lot of cross-border transactions. But if you appoint a lawyer from a remote place, a remote state, where the only thing they do is land matter or chieftaincy matter or local government matter or somebody stole somebody's ram, you will not probably get the best. You know, so for that, I will, I will, I will, I will, I will recommend that. I will recommend Nasir El Rufai for Minister of Defense because he's a no-nonsense person. We need him to go and blow up all the terrorists in the country. We need him to go after all the people that are causing problems in the country. And you need someone who does not care whose acts is God. He will go there with determination and no watch. As the governor of Cardinal State, he was giving quarterly reports on the number of people who were killed, on the number of people they've killed, they've arrested. I'm not aware of any other governor who does that, you know? So I would like a Nasir Erufai to be on that cabinet. I would also like a professor, Pat Utomi, to be on that cabinet. Then there's this lady, the, the woman leader of APC, Dr. Betty. I saw her interview on channels and I read up on her and I saw her. I think she's very, very fantastic. I think she's a very smart young lady. I think she should also be on that government as a representative of the youth. Then the youth leader of APC to die or Israel, I've read his story from nine years old. He started on his own, you know, going for a lot of scholarship programs. He's a young guy from grace to grass, from grass to grace. That kind of young guy too, he has a lot of clout. I think they should appoint that into their cabinet. Then some of all these flutter waves, all this FinTech, they should look for one of those guys in FinTech, whether flutter wave or one of all those companies making, making wave now, they should bring one of those youths to come and head technology. Because if you appoint someone from the dinosaur age as Minister of Communication and Digital Communication, I work for some telecom te technology companies as, as their lawyer. And when we are interfacing with some government, of, they don't understand the gig economy, you know, so it's alarming. So you need someone who understands what technology is all about. You need that kind of person in, 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 in the ministry, in, 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 in the ministry. So those are the ministers I can think of. And pastor too, I think you, you also, you also have a way of trying to, because your own, you have your own, your, you have your own, um, what's it called? You have your constituency and you're a well-respected voice in your constituency. If he has someone like you beside him, I think you will go a long way in quelling the agitation in the community amongst the, a lot of youths respect you whenever you're having a program. Everybody's always telling me they're Pastor Godalo's friend. And I wonder how many friends does Pastor Godalo has? Everybody that talks to me say they're close to him. They're close to him. How does he have time to interact with everybody in this kind of level, you know? So I think those are the, those are the, those are the, those are the ones I can, I can easily, those are the people I can easily work on. But you should work with El Rufai. And El Rufai has also mentored a lot of people. When he was governor of Kaduna, he had nine female commissioners and nine male commissioners. He had youths. He's very daring. And El Rufai can also recommend some other people to him. But if he has these people, these six people I've mentioned on his team, he can never fail because they would always tell the president what he needs to do. So I think he should, I think he should, I think he should do that. Then Rabbi Kwapanso, Kwapanso is a fantastic, is a fantastic individual. He has invested so much. He's the only governor I know who has sponsored a lot of children to go and school abroad as government was sending students to private university, investing heavily on them, you know? So he also, and he has large followership. He has been out of government for over for eight years and he still commands a huge followership in, in, in Kano. It takes the grace of God and he is actually a very good person for him to be able to deliver Kano for an unknown party, NNPP, an obscure party. And he had over 1 million votes. It means he's, 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 he's a very strong personality from that region. And you need a Kwapanso in your government maybe minister of works or something. Then you need Governor Wike, Yelson Wike, you need Wike to in your government because Wike, in terms of infrastructure in, in, in River State, he revolutionized um, um, River State. But you will need to tame him in terms of his talking and all that because Wike can face anybody at any point in time. But in terms of achieving results, because I don't care whether I like you, I don't like you. Once you can achieve the results, I want to be your friend. I want to work with you. So once he has these six people I've mentioned on his cabinet, we're going to have one of the best governments that Nigeria has ever seen. Then, sir, Pastor, sir, I'm sorry, I can't remember the second question. I lost track of the second question. Because <laughs> I was trying to think of names. I was trying to think of names, so you don't shoot me off guard. So I, I forgot the second question, sir. <laughs> yes, I was asking you, you know, um, if I, I myself can't remember the second question. I don't know if anybody can remember. Okay, sir, no problem. Yeah. <laughs> you know, the, the people... 
he should uh, he should appoint. And if there's any other thing, I think I've asked that question. Any okay, other, another thing that he needs to do. Yes, there's another yeah, thing. There's yeah. something else I think he needs to do. There's so much poverty. There's so much poverty in the land. There is mm. so much poverty in the land. I filled up my tank yesterday for 47,500 naira. And for the first time in a very long period of time, I was scared about Nigeria because I'm like 47,500 and I have to fill up my tank once a week. So I'm like, I mean, if I could be thinking about filling up my tank, then what a majority of Nigerians are going to be going through. And I also read a report that says that over 90% of Nigerians don't have 500,000 naira in their accounts. That's what mm. we call demographic catastrophe. So the president needs to look for a way to rejig the economy, support young businesses. And I'm happy that he talked about credit in his, gov in his um, speech. He talked about them um, having single foreign exchange um, um, rate and all those things. He needs to address poverty scientifically and frontally. It's a state of emergency. Young businesses, you need to go and meet them and ask them, how can we support you to thrive? How can we make young businesses employed? Because very soon now, our employees will start complaining that the money we are paying them is not enough for them, that they, they spend all their money on transport. What do we do? That means we have to increase money. If our clients are not increasing how much they are paying us, how do we survive as a business? It means that you want to, want to send more youth out of the country. So it needs to directly address the economy, businesses, young businesses, be supporting them. And not the one BOI was doing that. They were doing some, some fake program on channels, showing us some name of some obscure business that we've never heard of them. We need real businesses that employ real people, not businesses that government agency, the head of government agency are the ones, are the ones nominating names. Go and look for, go to Eco, you go to law firms, go and look for small law firms, look for people selling ice block, look for women that are fashion designer, look for credit people who on each in each community. Not that you just go and bring um, somebody's friend, somebody's sister that they don't really have any, they are just using that avenue to collect money. We heard that government has been paying people some money, trader money, or paying somebody something. I don't know anybody in my family that has collected that money. All those money that they say they are doing and palliative, this and that. I've never heard anybody in my paternal family that has collected that told me that they collected money from federal government or i saw what federal government did for them so that's what he needs to he needs to focus on number one number two he also needs to focus on devolution of power as the governor of lagos state ashwadi bola and challenge um um Obasan just government he challenged them that they were the federalism is not working we are running a feeding bottle system and all that so he needs to devolve power um security police we need to have state police you need to give them um, you need to give people um, the governors more power you need to allow them to take more percentage of the taxes they generate in their environment and all that. You need, he, he, he needs to work on that. And he needs to emulate President Obasanjo in terms of having eggheads as the head of government parastate house and agency. Don't go and bring someone that has not read the book for the past five years. Don't go and give someone that has retired, that does not, has not done anything for the past 10 years. But the only thing he has is because he supported Ashwari Tinubu or is a friend to Tinubu's son or something, and he just wants to go wake him up again. The way some parties do that, we bring in people that have not been working. Appoint people that are active. Don't appoint someone that has retired, that has gone out of circulation for the past 10 years. That way, now checking for the past 10 what has he been doing? He was living in America. What was it in America? It was just faffing around. We need people that are up to yesterday, they were still engaged in their jobs. So he needs to do that. Once he does that and focus on rule of law, our judiciary, our judges are not being well paid. They are not being well taken care of. And if we don't take care of, take care of the judiciary, they are susceptible to collecting bribes from people. They are not happy to deliver judgments. They don't work very well. Our judges write in long hand. It doesn't make any sense in this day and age. Our judges have no business writing in long hand. You should be recording them. The, 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 the courts should be conducive. That their school fees for their children should be easy. When they retire, I see some judges granting interview. I've retired. They've not paid me my, my allowance. They've not paid me my pension. It's appalling. You should focus on, 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 on the judiciary as well and appoint eggheads around peg in a round, in a round hole. So those are the things I think once he does all this, Pastor, you, you might even join his campaign if he wants to go for second term, if he achieves all what I've told him to do now. For his second term, he might even be on the rostrum advocating for Nigerians to vote for him. <laughs> okay, it's all right. Let me leave you. Other people have questions to ask you. Don't let me hug the microphone. Uh, many hands are up. So let me take three questions very quickly. Bayo, Noyo, and uh, and uh, I think Noyo has raised his hands. He has two, maybe he has two, two systems here. And then I don't know who iPad guest is. Please rename yourself, whoever I, 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 iPad guest is before I call you. 
and then Oluwaro Timi. So let's take uh, Bayo, Noyo, and Oluwaro Timi. And uh, I don't know, Sonny, if you're on the platform, you can take it away from there. Okay, Pastor, thank you very much. So Bayo, go ahead with your question. Okay, okay. Uh, thank you so much. Good evening. And I'm Florence, Pastor. Florence. Uh, yes, sir. Uh, okay, um, I have um, two questions. Um, one is about INEC. Um, you know, they've been performing. Um, I, 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 I don't want to read their performance, really, but I think I just want to ask, um, who should INEC be responsible to? Or how do people hold INEC accountable? You know, we don't want to have situations whereby every time we have an election, we have to wait for the court to decide who wins. You know, so what are the policy changes that we should expect or or or, or law or laws that should be made that you know that will make INEC really um functional and optimal? And the second question is um you talked about Tinubu and how he performed as governor. So I want to know what do you think about his age and how will age affect his performance in this in this administration if um if if at all the courts says that he's the true, you know, the true winner of the election. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much, Bayo. Um, we will take Noyo, but uh, Farouk, add to that age question his health. So consider the two together. Okay, <laughs> uh, Noyo, go ahead and mute yourself and, and ask your question. Yes, good afternoon. Good afternoon. Yes. Um, my question is so difficult uh, to ask any question, but everything to me is based on speculation right now. Uh, we are not sure of where we are going to and how things are going to be. With all the uh, cases we have uh, before the tribunal. However, you made mention of um, her, um, Rufai, that you'll be somebody you want to be in this government. Uh, thinking about her Rufai, my what I know from what I've read and what I've heard, I think that um, it wasn't fair to all the citizens of Kaduna State, especially the Southern Zaria Christian community there. So if he's coming out to be on the Tunibu government and you want him to be in charge of the defense, if I heard that right, uh, what kind of a person do you think he's going to be? Because a lot of things happen in Kaduna State, a lot of outcry against his government. Um, it's difficult to know the truth, but however, that's what we heard. I don't think uh, it's going to be someone that will be, what will I say, that we, that will be fair to everyone, that everyone wants that we, that we be considerate to all the various groups in Nigeria. And when we talk, talk about this Islamic something, his name always comes up. His name always comes up. So I don't know if it is, if there's any truth to that. Uh, okay. I just want Thank to bring it, much. let you know. Thank yeah. you. Thank you very much, Noyo. Uh, before I call on the next person, let me just make a clarification. You know, this is just about charting a new course for the government. And like um, Noyo said, it's all speculation. So please, let's not... Um, I know somebody else may want to respond to these things and we'll make an argument about whether this person know. These are not the people that will be in the cabinet. And Farouk have not said that the people, he's just saying in his own view, these are the people that he thinks. And uh, for whatever reason, I think he's entitled to that. So I'm only saying this so that others don't come up to begin to respond to this particular thing he said. Um, All right. let's, let's ask the questions and um, I'll take the next person. Um, Oluwa Rotimi, unmute yourself, ask your question. Can you unmute Oluwa Rotimi to ask his question? We'll take those first three and then after we'll take um, another three sets. So, sorry, I unmuted Anthony, he was next. So do you want okay, me to- Okay, all right, that's yeah. okay, that's okay. Um, I, I thought Oluwa Rotimi was the person pastor called. Yes, hello, yes. Um, good afternoon, everybody. Can you hear me, please? Yes, we can. Can you hear me? Yeah, no, we, we can, can speak. Can. Go ahead. Okay, great. All right, so um, a couple of things. Um, the election 
um, I, I'm kind of stunned, honestly stunned, at the kind of way, the way we reason. Some of us reason with respect to democracy. It is not a system of who has the biggest guns, largest money, or whatever that is. As it says, government of the people, for the people, and by the people. So if we get that wrong, then we are not practicing democracy. It's as simple as that. Uh, regarding um, saying let's move on, INEC will improve later or something. No, they're missing the point. I've been conducting research on this map, and the research shows that INEC targeted the presidential election. And people say, oh, the governorship election and the, uh, I'm sorry, the um, House of Rep and all that, and the Senate, they went fine. So this is the best election ever. No, it was a mafia operation to target the presidential election specifically. So, for example, with respect to the numbers, APC came first, PDP second, Labour third. Those were from fictitious statistics. And anyone who knows about statistics knows the data you get, the value of data determines the results you have. So if I like to conduct the population census, I says China is 200 million and Nigeria is 1.5 billion. Some of us will say, well, I like I said, Nigeria is 1.5 billion and uh, uh, China is 200 million. And that's the awareness. So what I'm saying in essence is this, please educate yourselves, conduct your research, and don't be too gullible with respect to the result from INEC on the presidential election. It was a big fraud, big fraud. And hopefully the court will do the right thing and we'll be out of business. Thank you. Pastor Sonny. I think uh, you can respond to those questions. Eh? All right, sir. Okay. Okay, so All I'll right. go with the first question. Okay, Bayer asked them, um, who should we hold responsible and who should INEC be responsible to? And should we change our laws? Okay, yes, thank you for that question, Bayer. We don't need to change our laws. The new electoral acts we have is a very, very fundamental law. They made a lot of changes to the law. There are a lot of offenses there. The, um, the, the compliance, the level of um, independence of um, electoral officers, the bar has been increased. There were a lot of offenses that were created, and you know their 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 punishment and jail term sentences and years and and fine to pay. But the problem we've had is that it is the government that prosecutes. So if you have so in the past, what we've had is that I, INEC has not really pursued prosecuting electoral offenders. If they have, it has been it has been a tepid kind of um, prosecution. Um, it was a weak form of prosecution, and we've not really heard about jail term sentences for election regards and all of that, except from the fact that American embassy and the UK embassy, they started denying some people visa on the role they play in the election. So if you see America and UK saying, we have placed some people on no-fly list because of their roles during election, it means that these countries are very serious. What has the federal government done? What has INEC done? If foreign countries can be more concerned about your election, then what are you doing? Foreign governments give gov money to INEC, to NGOs in Nigeria to ensure that we have a fair election. So what is the country doing? So it goes back to what I said earlier. The government has to take the lead. As citizens now, I'll ask you, um, Bio, in your area, of all these electoral offenders that you are aware of that they've done, have you written any petition to INEC before or to the police before to say, in my area, I voted in this area on the day of election, this person was sharing money, I took picture, I took video, this is it, submitted to EFCC or submitted to the police. Then when you write your petition and they don't action it, then go and meet ALG or go and meet Pastor Ibudalo. Pastor, I wrote this petition, look at the evidence I have, and this guy is still going, he's still twerking online, he's still going on social media playing. How many of us have done that? We haven't. But if the government can bail the cat, that will be fine. So as far as our laws are concerned, we don't need to change our laws to stop, to bring sanity into the system. We just need the political will to drive our laws. For example, now everybody will tell you that it wasn't the president Tinubu that stopped subsidy, that the, the Petroleum Act has removed subsidy and all that. But it took a president Tinubu to mention it in his speech, even if indirectly, that subsidy has ended. Meanwhile, we had the president that gave him, handed over to him that did not see anything on that, that was pussyfooting and prevaricating on, 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 on those matters. So it's the political will, our laws are fantastic. They've been, they've been updated. And as they are, 
they can they can they can deal with anybody who, who commits a crime. So to answer your question, INEC is accountable to Nigerians. The police can prosecute, the presidency can prosecute. So as an organization, now you can tell people if you have evidence of electoral crimes, electoral offenses, collate them together with your evidences and submit them to ALG. ALG can do a petition to the Inspector General of Police. We have 75 cases of electoral issues in Nigeria. This KBAC in this area sends people away and we have recordings. Go and prosecute him. Thankfully, KBACs don't have immunity under the law. Then if they don't take those actions, then we can now escalate it to the social media, to the news, to foreign government agencies, and they will take action on it. But we cannot shout on social media. And that, well, that's my problem with a lot of Nigerians. We just keep on shouting on social media, expressing a lot of bile on WhatsApp groups and anger, but you're, you, you're not translating into actions. So I, I want to tell people who supported Peter Obi in the last election, you did not lose. If there is any winner in that election, it is those who supported Peter Obi who are the winners because they achieved fundamental results that some people will spend billions of naira and they will spend 10 years to plan for. I am on the field. I've run an election before. I was involved in the last election. I know what it takes to run the campaign. I know what it takes to fund the campaign. But this was a movement that was fundamental. It was heavy. It was heavy. So they did not lose at all. If Peter Obi did not win, he has won. If he did not win, he has, he's the, in this election, as far as I'm concerned, he is the real winner, as far as I'm concerned. If you look at the history, I study history a lot. I study a lot of politi well, political leaders. I read their biographies. Nobody, people hardly win at their first attempt. They hardly win, especially when you're dealing with rogues. Pol Nigerian politicians are very smart. Um, Anthony mentioned a question that uh, is a mafia attempt. Of course, it's, it's going to be. I'm not saying that there was no mafia attempt. Nigerian politicians would throw everything in the ball, everything in the on the table to achieve their results. They use everything, both spiritually, whatever they can do, they will do worse than what they can do. So now they've given Peter Obi supporters an idea of the mafia approach they can do. Then you prepare for the future. Challenge them in court if you have your evidence. If you're able to win in court, fine. If you can't win in court, regroup yourself. Don't, 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 don't nag. Don't cry. Bari cried on TV. Tinubu had to beg him, Damas Okumo, you run this time and you will win. You go back to the drawing board. When you lose an election, you go back to the drawing board. You look at your weak points. See, if you want to be, only if you want to be deceitful. Peter Obi was not strong in the Northeast, in the Northwest. He was not strong in the Northeast. He might have had supporters there, but he was not strong. Who were the voices that were with him in those areas? Elections are won, you must have people on ground. We say structure, 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 that he didn't have structure. He had the best structure because his structure was an invisible structure. His structure was in the hearts of Nigerians. You didn't pay them. My cousins came out on election day to have sack a polling agent. My cousin that was a CFO of, his, of a company listed on the stock exchange, Nigerian stock exchange. She was a polling agent to Peter Obi. I live in Magodo. All the polling units, Peter Obi won all the polling units, almost everything. And he never came to my good, and he did not give anybody money. So let's be let's be fair, let's be real. Yes, we didn't get the results we wanted, but you guys won. Those of you supported Peter Obi, you won. He must have come third, but he came first because he had a short period to campaign, and he did not spend shishi, according to him. And I know because he wasn't giving anybody money. But these guys, if you ask them, there are some victories that are free victories. Some victories when you calculate, like what Pastor Tony Bakari said. He said it is better to lose some war than to win some kind of battle. If you win a particular kind of battle, and what's the toll on your body, the toll on your system. Some people, Marcos Aurelius, a philosopher, he said that some people, they will struggle for an office, struggle for something. When they get there, they will not start thinking that, I think I made a mistake. Look at how much I lost just to get to this office. Was it worth it? So let's be real. Let's, emotions don't win election. It's a numbers game. These guys are planning for the next four years again. And some people are busy talking that uh, they rigged election, they did mafia approach, when some people are already in court. That energy, channel it to the right place. If you are not satisfied, go and start regrouping again, talking to your supporters and wait for them. Four years is a very short period. Four years is a very, very short period. If you are really serious about having the kind of leaders you want, then don't make noise. They, Peter Obi took us with a, with a bang, a big bang. Although they were making noise on social media, but even I on that, I said he can never have up to 2 million votes. That I wasn't expecting him to have more than 1.5 million votes. That if he has 2 million votes, he has succeeded. Because a lot of people were hiding. They didn't tell us who they were supporting. But I started suspecting for my office. When I asked my lawyers in the office, who are you people supporting? Peter Obi, Peter Obi, Peter, ah, in this office. Okay, let's see. Maybe it's just people who are, you know. So he, he, he tried because he campaigned within a short period. Atiku has been running for president since 1991. You can't just come from nowhere and push him away in the Northeast, in the Northwest. Someone who came third when MQ Abiola ran for president, he came third. He was a vice president. 
for, for eight years, not even the normal president, a powerful vice president whom the president had to prostrate to, to get the second term ticket. You think it's a pushover? Then your president of your country was not supporting Buhari Tinubu fully. They gave some people support indirectly. Then you now had all this noise, all the poverty in the land, insecurity, petrol, scarcity, no money. Ah, let's be fair to God. Let's be fair. Politicians would always play any system. They will always do that. So it's not, a, it's not an issue to be making noise about. Then somebody asked me about Tinubu's age and performance. That's the honest truth. His age would hinder his performance. No doubt about it. The level of the hindrance will now depend on the kind of team he has. Because a Tinubu of 15 years ago will probably be able to travel to Lagos today, go to Kano tomorrow. Because when I say the youth are not happy, how do you make the youth happy? You can't sit down in Nassau Rock and think the youth will be happy with you. When they're having some events, technology events in Lagos, show up there. They're having an event in Kano, show up there. A leader has to be present. I read a, there's a story about a, 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 a companion of the Prophet, Salam, Umar. At night, when he was the caliph, at night, he would disguise himself and he would go within the community and he would start asking people, ha, you, have you eaten? What do you think about your, your, your leader? They will now say, ah, that our leader is a stupid person. We don't have food to eat. He will now start crying. He will go home. He will go and bring a bag of rice and give them food. So as a president, you need to be active to move around. Not that after you spend some minutes somewhere, you'll be saying, when am I going on? When am I doing this? You cannot go out. That just isn't that in rock. No, you have to be on the streets. Just like the way Christians do that, they go for outreach programs. You can't do outreach in your house. Outreach, you have to go to the streets, go to where the smokers are, go to where the prostitutes are, go to where the touts are. You have to reach out to them. So his age will affect him from going about. But if he has a good team, they can cover up for it. But whichever way, it will affect. if he was supposed to deliver 100 items to us, his age will make him give us 80. But if he has a good team, he will give us 80. But if he doesn't have a good team and his age, there's a limit to how much time he can spend on, on, on the screen or reading a file. There are some files that you need five hours to read. You need 10 hours listening to briefing from morning to night. If he doesn't have the physical stamina, if they're giving him the briefing, he will just slip off. When they're telling him about Boko Haram, or oh, come and sign this thing, he will just slip off. So it will affect him, but if he has a good team, they can cover up for him. Then his health, his health too can affect him. But the truth is that we have to be real. There are people who, when they get into office, they don't know that they have an ailment. And when they get into office, they have ill health. So the fact that a man has an health challenge, a health challenge is not something for us to pillory him about or to make fun of him or to wish him death. But the truth is that once you become a leader, you're a public figure. We expect transparency on your health. If you are sick, we will sympathize with you. But if you have cancer, don't tell us you have ear pain. If you have typhoid, don't tell us that you have just a scratch, you know? Be transparent with the citizens who even love you more. We've had presidents in the history of other countries that were ill, some of them were on wheelchair, and they were still ruling, and their citizens were praying for them. So his health can also affect his capacity. Same way, if a husband has bad health, it can affect him from renting his, his, um, his, um, his actions as a good husband or as a father to his children, you know? But it's God that gives good health. My father fell ill in November 2019, and he died in February 2020. Within a period of four months, three months, it was a very short period. So some people can be ill, and they will have long life. But if he's ill, you can't say because he's ill, he should not be despondent and he should not do anything and he should just sit down in one place and go and die. No. So even if you have ill health, you must also aspire about not presidency, but if he doesn't have anybody to challenge him. Because Nigerians, we don't learn from history. Look at in 2015. After Buhari had run three times and he lost, they knew that they couldn't win without coming together. And they called all the opposition figures. And they took three years to come together. And they flushed out Jonathan easily. So what stopped PDP and Peter Obi and Kwakwansu from coming together? Or even if three of them cannot come together, if Kwakwansu and Peter Obi had come together, Peter Obi would have won that election because they would have gotten more votes. People would have, a lot of people love Kwakwansu, but they did not vote for him because they felt his party was going nowhere. But if they see a Kwakwansu and a Peter Obi, some PDP people might even move from PDP and go to that camp. So you have a divided house and you want to win an incumbent government. It's not done anywhere. It's a recipe to failure. So his health will also affect him, but he needs to be transparent with us on his health. What is wrong with you? We are voting for you. We are the ones funding you because I pay my taxes. So if you start flying the presidential address from tomorrow now, I'm the one, we are the ones paying for it. So we have to know what are you dealing with so that we can know what to expect from you and we can pray for you. But if we don't know what you, if you say, yeah, yeah, I'm, feel, I'm, hel I'm healthy, we can't pray for you. So you are not honest with us. And as a leader, you have a fiduciary relationship with your citizens. You must be honest and open with them. If you don't want anybody to know whether you have cancer or you have a health challenge, don't run for office. Because when I was running for office, People will tell you that if you want to know how 
how your father toasted your mother or the nights they conceived you, run for office. People will tell you story. So the moment you run for office, you must you are open to scrutiny. So yes, we have to be sincere that his health, the state of his health will affect him because looking at him, he doesn't have the stamina. He's 70 years old. Even Joe Biden, you can see him stuttering, moving, frail, you know. So to affect them, you can't compare that kind of president to the president of Canada or the president of France. You can't. The energy is there, the brilliance. They, they can move around. They can hop on planes. They can contribute. They can use iPads. All these old president, they cannot use iPad. They cannot even write speech. They cannot even type. They cannot even type WhatsApp. So it will affect us, but I mean, it's what it is. We still have a number of years to plan. So Grace asked, El Rufai wasn't fair to the Southern community. The truth is that we all have our foibles and we have our challenges. I've not said El Rufai is a saint. I've not said I agree with all what El Rufai did. I mean, I've not said that. I've only said, I only talk because my philosophy is I like to focus on the good side because the good side is usually more than the bad side. So I focused on his good side. Was it fair to the Southern Kaduna or not? The way they were agitating and agitating and agitating, I felt that he could have managed it better, especially balancing it. Because historically, whenever PDP is in government, we balance the governorship and we give somebody else deputy in Southern Kaduna. We balance the Christian Muslim religion. But you know, Erufai is bold, he's daring. He might have done his numbers. You might have seen the game and say, okay, there are three central DC, Southern Kaduna, how many of them have PVC? Even if I appoint, maybe he felt that even if he appoints the Sultan of Sokoto as his running mate, or if he gives them something, they might still not vote for him. So maybe he has done the numbers and he doesn't want to lose. But I'm not saying that is right. But I can assure Nigerians and I can assure people of other faiths that no president can Islamize or Christianize Nigeria. With our experience with Buhari, any president will be circumspect. Look at um, Shetima three days ago announcing to us that uh, my CSO is from Northern Central, he's a Christian. My ADC is a Christian. Who is asking you all that? Tell us about the contract, your, the real appointment. But he's saying all that because he can feel the heat. They know their victory is not a solid victory and they are embarrassed, but they took a gamble by using a Muslim Muslim ticket. So now they are saying Senate president, now they are appointing an Akpabio as a Senate president because he's a Christian. Now look at what we are going into now. Akpabio is not someone I want as a Senate president by all standard. I don't want an Akpabio as my Senate president. But now they've now hid under the Christian that because he's a Christian, trying to manipulate the Christians. If he's a Christian, is it the best Christian? If you say you're representing the Muslims, and you are not a practicing Muslim, and you don't pray five daily prayers, you don't follow the dictates of the Quran, are you really a representative of the Muslim? So let's not allow religion, because politicians are very smart. They will use religion to divide us. They will use ethnicity. They will use anything to divide us. So El Rufai cannot come into any government parastatal now, and he will say he wants to, he wants to, and I know Pastor, Pastor is very good friends with El Rufai. Pastor Tukul Bakari is also very good friend with El Rufai. El Rufai has some very, very, very solid Christian friends. And I'm sure if El Rufai was an irredentist, or an extremist, I'm sure Pastor will not interact. Pastor Igudalo will not interact with him. And I'm sure Pastor will not be proud to call him his friend. But the last time I checked, I know that he's, on, he's a very good friend of Pastor. So he might have his own mistakes. And that's why we have advisors. We can now tell him and say, oh boy, when you were the governor of Kaduna, you were not fair to us in the South. This ministry now, if we give you now, better be careful. And you will, will balance it. Because as leaders, we must always listen to feedback. Nobody is perfect. We will continue to aspire for an ideal situation until we die. So El Rufai is not a perfect human being. Maybe sidelining the Southern Kaduna was his own foible or his challenge as, 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 the, as the governor of Kaduna State. But I believe that if he becomes a minister, we will warn him and we'll tell him because it is not in our interest for any religion to dominate Nigeria. It doesn't serve us right because if we go anywhere, they can attack us and say, you guys are the Muslims that are taking over this country. You guys are the Islam that are taking over this country. So we need to look at what's happening in the Southeast. Look at IPOB. They don't have sense of, I told my people in Lagos, I told some of my relatives, that you can't say Christians should not be angry and um, Igbo people should not be angry. They pay the highest taxes. They are business, they are traders. So you collect their money and you don't want them to have political voice. It's not done anywhere in the world. Whoever controls the money controls the political system. So you can't tell them that they can't run for governor. Why would you tell them that? Why, you, why do you rent your houses to them? A house of two million, you rent it to Igbos for four million. Go to Lekki, go to Iko. Igbos are bought almost everywhere because they have economic power. They are traders. They don't believe in doing parties too much. The ones that make money legitimately amongst them. They don't believe they are, they are businessmen. So when they are businessmen, after making money, the next thing is that they want power. You must manage them, but you can't tell them to go to hell. You don't do that. So you, you have to carry them along. So we, we, we will speak up. We will tell them because we have Christian friends. We have Christians in our family. So we can't, we can't push Christians away and say everything is Muslim. Why is government messed us up in that regard? We have never been this divided in the history of Nigeria. We have never been this divided. So that's another thing Tinubu needs to do. He needs to heal us. He needs to unify us 
Unfortunately, Atiku was the one who called himself a unifier. So I hope that Tinubu will be able to unify us, even though he didn't call himself a unifier. So the next question is Anthony's question, where he said he stunned at the way we reason, and INEC targeted the presidential election, and it was a mafia operation. Satik says, uh, you know, he spoke a lot of grammar and all that. I've told you already, Tinubu is a smart guy. He wanted to achieve the results, whatever it takes. That's the way Nigerian politicians reason. So if you want to go against a political leader, you know that it's not going to be black and white. It's not going to be black and white alone. You need to plan for all those things. So now they've showed you now that they can, they can rig you through, through statistics. So if you want to support somebody else for president, when you join his, go and join his campaign, in his strategy team, advise him that in 2023 election, they rig us through the statistics. Let us plan against it this time around. This is what we'll do. But when they show you that, then you, 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 you respond to it. But to expect that there will be an election in Nigeria where somebody will not try to rig is not possible because even in America, people try to game the system. Somebody will be in Nigeria and he will be voting in America and it's not allowed. So let's not think that there's any, there's, any, there's any perfect democracy anywhere in the world or there's any perfect election anywhere in the world. The degree of the manipulations or challenges might vary, but anybody who wants to win an election, politics is a game of wits and you use everything you have to win your election. If Atiku comes to Oshun State, he will tell us that uh, my first wife is a Yoruba woman and then uh, vote for me, I'm from Oshun State. If he goes to Anambra, he will say my fourth wife is Uche, Uche Na, I'm, I'm your son. If he comes to meet pastor, he can tell pastor that pastor, you can see that I don't call myself a large Atiku, I'm a, I'm a liberal Muslim, I'm your friend. So politicians will always play on all those sentiments. So let's not cry about spilled milk when they rig us out. You plan not to, Alex Oti won an election in Abia State. Do you know what it means for Alex Oti to win an election in Abia State? Do you know who Ikweazu is? Hey, those guys are very, those guys are guys that believe so much in power. And, and Labour Party won Lagos State. How were they able to win Lagos State? It means that they did something. What they did in Lagos State that they won Lagos State, let them replicate it in other states. So even if they want to reduce you scientifically, maybe they will just reduce your votes. Maybe if you had 1 million votes, they can reduce it to 700,000, but they will not say you didn't win. In Kano states where NMPP won, do you think they, they did not try to rig them out? But they learned from experience. In Oshun State 2018, we won our election. We knew we won the election. But they, 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 they played games on us. And when we came back in 2023, we were better prepared. And we showed them back. So that's the way they run politics. So, Pastor, I've answered all the questions, sir. OK, thank you. Sorry. Go ahead, please. All right. Thank you so much for the opportunity. Uh, Mr. Farouk Abbas, thank you for the way you've tackled most of the questions. Uh, there was a news report that uh, that came on the scene a few days ago about how to cut the cost of governance in Nigeria. And one of the ex-governors from the North, Mr. Shekarao, is of the opinion that the current government should do away with the Senate and the House of Reps. Uh, there are many ways to skin a cat. I know his objective is to see how we can cut down the expensive structure that we currently are running so but what's your opinion i'm not a legal person but i would like to hear from your from you is that a possible or a feasible solution under a constituted under a legally constituted uh, government like uh, uh, like we have now for a president with a fiat to just say I'm not doing, I'm not dealing with both the Senate and the House of Reps at this time. I'm going to do away with one of them. Also, but let's go back to his objective. How best can we achieve a, a, a slimmer govern, governmental structure that still gives us the benefits of democracy? That's my first question. The second one is about youth development. Every now and then, Every new government always seems to want to focus more on sports development as far as youth is concerned. And I'm worried, given what we currently have uh, with the advent of AI and other new technologies, does it still make sense that we should be bounding, maybe banding at youth development along with sports? Shouldn't we? actually split that, that ministry under this new regime and probably look at 
creating a youth and entrepreneurial development ministry. And uh, let sports and any other thing go along with, uh, I mean, go, go, go together instead of combining youth and sports development. So what are your views on these two key issues? Thank you. Okay, um, go ahead and um, respond to that since we don't have Okay, any... thank you. Thank you very much, um, Oluwaro. That's a very brilliant question, especially the second one. So I'll answer the first one. What's my opinion on reducing the cost of governance and um, um, Shekarawa's, or Senator Shekarawa's opinion about um, abolishing the legislature? The truth is that um, there are many ways we can reduce cost of governance. When you run a democracy, democracy thrives on structure, on checks and balances. There are three arms, there's the judiciary, executive, and the legislature. The moment you remove the legislature, what you have is, a, is, an, is an autocracy, a dictatorship, because you need an arm of government that can, that can call the president to order, that can make laws for the country, that can be a pulse of the people. The legislature is making a significant contribution to our democracy because they ordinarily are meant to represent the people. They are the closest to the grassroots. My House of Rep member is my very good um, friend and leader, and I interact with him. When I have issues that pertain to my community, I call him on Rebam Dele Salam, and he's extremely responsive. So if you say we should cancel and abolish the legislature, it is not possible by fiat because the constitution is what sets up the structure of government. So if you want to abolish the legislature, what you will need to do is to amend the constitution. But the people who you want to abolish cannot abolish themselves. So it is not realistic unless it's not realistic, legally speaking. But really, how do you reduce cost of governance? On the inauguration day of the president, Bola Tinubu, they said one aircraft took um, the President Bari's children to, to Dara. Another aircraft was taking him to Dara. Then there's another aircraft for the President. Then another aircraft was taking President um, um, Vice President Toshiba to Lagos or wherever he was going to. So four presidential craft. Like it doesn't make any sense. Foreign countries will be laughing at us. Look at this country. They are debtors. They are owing over 50 trillion naira, and yet they are flying jets. We don't have any business flying. We don't have. We don't. We don't, we don't deserve to own presidential jets when we don't even have a national carrier. It doesn't make any sense. It is illogical. It shows us as clowns in the in 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 in, in international community. You don't have a national carrier yet. You have presidential fleets of almost nine aircraft. Is this is the, is the height of unseriousness and um, lack of exposure? So if you want to reduce the cost of governance, we can start from that. That's number one. Number two, the vice, the uh, president, I am former president Buhari, his wife, Aisha Buhari, told us that they spent 20 something billion to have a, 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 a state house clinic. Why spend 21 billion era on state house clinic when you have not spent that kind of amount on other hospitals around the country? So we can cut that down. If you see the entourage of some governors, you will be scared of, you will be scared. When you see some governors move around with almost 25 mobile policemen, they will have entourage, they will have boss for media aid, they will have boss for a friend of the governor, they have different people on their entourage. Whenever an average governor is traveling, they will go around with hangers on and their feeding will be on the state. So we need to, we can cut down the size of government by saying that maybe the governor should reduce his entourage whenever he's traveling. Nobody should travel by private jets. During the G5 crisis, you hear the G5 governors have gone to London, private jets, they have gone to Spain. Who is paying for those, for those trips? Is, it, is, it, is the state is one pain? So we need to cut. Um, but why do we have all this? The assembly is um, are meant to cover all that, but they don't because we have we have um, 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 pushovers out as, as, as of assembly, national assembly. They can't speak up. So a governor who is sincere, a governor who is sincere. If I become a governor today, I can't drive the latest version of any car because I will fear God that there is poverty in the land. My conscience, I won't be able to sleep. I can drive a moderate car. And I won't have too many aides around me that you see governor going and you see so many people. I, I won't like all that. So I will live an austere life such that the people will relate with me and know that, okay, I'm trying to cut costs. I won't waste too much money having parties, spending money, donating money to look at the way governor Wiki was donating money. Somebody will come, you donate 70 million, this one 50 million. That's wastage. So we can cut the waste. And again, our budget process, there is no serious thought process that goes into the making of the Nigerian budget. And I say that with all sense of respect and sincerity. There are some people who work at the National Assembly, as staff of the National Assembly, and they deliberately go to hide figures in the budget. And when the budget is approved, they will go back, maybe they approve the budget in my federal constituency. Somebody who is not a member of the House of Rep will go and meet the rep of that constituency and tell him that this, budget, this project, this 20 billion road project waiting for your constituency, nobody you put them there, Namino has a rich deal. And this is a person who is not a member. I, have, I know someone who boasted on Facebook that he attracts projects to, have, to the federal constituency. And he's not a member of the House of Rep. 
So the question you should ask yourself is, how is somebody who is not a member of the House of Rep, who is only a staff or an aide to another member, how was he able to influence projects in a budget? It means that no serious thought process, and that's another thing about the governor, Nasir El Rufai, Nasir El Rufai, the amount of money he budgeted for health and education in his state is higher than the, the number that um, the United Nations recommend. He budgeted as far as high as maybe 15% or 20 something percent on those areas. Meanwhile, in Nigeria, the federal government, our recurrence is more than our, 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 our capital expenditure. So they are still different ways. Why should the private jet take the children of the president to Dara? Who, who will pay their salary? Who, who will fuel the aircraft? It doesn't make any sense. Why can't they go to Dara by road? Why can't they go to Dara by road? Or why can't can they fly a, pri a, a private plane, a, a commercial plane? So those are ways that we can, we can, we can stop all those things. That no, no, if you go abroad for your treatment, the state will not pay for you. The government will only pay for your health if you go to General Hospital in Lasut or you go to Lut. By the time the governor of Lagos State goes to Lasut and nobody can attend to him, or there's no bed space for him to get an admission. He will focus more money in, the, in Lasut or he will expand the hospital. But they don't see what Nigerians are going through because if they have health challenge, they go to London. So if you want to go to London, we should amend our laws, have a policy that once I become governor, if I go abroad for my medical trip or my children's school abroad, the state must not pay for it. I will pay for my personal income that I have. If we have that, we will reduce. And no governor should donate state money for any 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 any, any organization. A church came to greet you. Imam came to greet you. You are donating money to Ansarudin. What is the business of the government with donating money to Ansarudin? So we those are ways that we, if we, if, we, if we are pragmatic enough to cut all those, we will save a lot of money. We will save a lot of money. Look at the immigration party of some states. Champagne everywhere. The, we, are in a, we are in sober moment. No serious governor who knows what he's doing to organize any inauguration party to be popping champagne and be dancing when people are suffering, they don't have money to eat, and you are busy dancing on national television. Is it calls for sober moments? You will be brainstorming, you will even be able to celebrate. But you are popping champagne, you are inviting artists, artists are singing and you are dancing. We don't deserve to be dancing because we are in serious, we are in that, we are in that times. So that's to answer that question. Therefore, youth development. Um, Oluwari Timi, that's also a very good question. You know, the quality of your leadership determines the output of the government. Why we always have youth and sport development is that that's the level of the capacity of the reasoning of our leaders. In the past, everybody just believed that the only way to empower youth is sports. Share um, a lot of grinding machine, keke na pep, motorcycle. That's what you understand as empowerment because they are not exposed. Some of them, if you, if you ask some member of the House of Rep, AI, some of them don't know the meaning of AI. Some of them don't know. And even if they want to Google, they don't even know how to use Google to go and check the meaning of AI. So the quality of leadership determines the quality, the output you get. So I personally, I agree with your idea, what you said, that we should have a ministry for youth and entrepreneurial development. When we talk about youth now, what we mean development is empower them to be able to stand alone. SMEs are the ones that drive the American economy. Small businesses employ more people. So create, look at the way people are coming up with Flutterwave, Bolt, different, different, different apps, software that are having direct impact on the lives of Nigerians. There's Glovo, there are apps that you can order food. People shop on Instagram now. A lot of people, my wife sells on Instagram. People don't shop on Instagram. People don't go to the market anymore. They shop on Instagram. It's somebody's idea. Some people are making money, you know, so support them. So I agree with you. Sports, and again, sports is also a very good way to also take away hooliganism. All these area boys, all these people, you can engage them to sports because Nigeria, we have significant talents in sports. So you can separate sports ministry. But if you combine sports and youth development, that shows that you don't know what you are doing because they don't go together. They don't go together, separate them. So that's a very fundamental point. I hope the president will know about this point and, and work on it because sports ministry should stay alone and youth and entrepreneurial development should stay separate. So I, I also align, I align with that argument and it's, it's, a, it's a brilliant observation. Thank you very much. Um, thank you, Mr. Farouk. We have a few questions. It's been a brilliant uh, presentation so far. So thank you for all the very um, potent information you've put forth. There are three questions in the chat that I would like to read out to you. And I also have a question. So the first question is, um, Please, how does the president restructure the Nigerian military that seems to be in the pocket of a region and also stop corruption in the army? And um, so do you have that or should I post it to you in the chat? I have it. I have it. Do you okay. want me to answer it right away? No, I'm going to give you the other two. Then the second question is the government needs to restructure the country. We need a people's constitution. We need to go back to regional government using the six geopolitical zones. 
What do you think? And the last question from the chat, and we have a couple more. Um, what do you think about the appointment of ministers of state? So those are the three questions. Okay, thank you very much. So let me start from the first one. How does the president restructure the, the, the Nigerian army that has been dominated by a particular region? You know, one of the fundamental problems that um, we have, I can speak for the Yoruba, I can't speak for any other tribe, is that we tend to believe that we are very enlightened and we are very sophisticated and some, some, some jobs are beneath us. But those of us who say that we are the same people who will go to another country and go and be driving Uber and go and be working in supermarket as sales um, rep and all that. What I'm trying to say is that there is honor in labor. We should not chip in any career or any profession. Even if you're an Uber driver in Nigeria, you should be respected. If you're a cleaner in Nigeria, you should be respected. So there should be honor in labor. But you have a region, because we need to understand that the Northerners understand political administration. If there's anything they have going for them is that they understand the importance of power. They believe that power makes everything. But we in the South believe in education, enlightenment, speaking grammar, wearing suits, and all of that. But the Northerners know where power is. So the, I read um, um, Babangida's um, biography, and they wrote it there that when he was in secondary school, some Northern leaders came to secondary schools to scout for people who would join the army, and they enlisted them en masse. But when they came to the South, they said, no, I want my child to be a medical doctor, a professor, a gynecologist. And of course, we have all that. So these people have joined the army a very long time ago. So if you are going to restructure, you can't restructure with a swoop of the hand or the pen. You have to be strategic. In life, when you are fighting for power, you have to be strategic. Power is not a, an overnight affair. It's a marathon. So now we too have to encourage our children. There are some arms of government that if they say who is the next is about rank, unless they retire all the people that are there now and now admit and now make um, the youngest you're about to become the, the controller general or the general of the army or whatever, you, what, what, what have you. So we too have to be deliberate. Let us send our children to the army. The army still carries out recruitment. Two years ago, three years ago, we want senior officers. We want doctors. We want lawyers. We want combatants. If, I, if we do a poll on this, on this call now and say all the people on this call who have children who are working, how many of us have children in the military? You will see that almost we can't be up to 1%. But if we do this kind of program in the north, they will have cousins and brothers. An average northerner who works in Nigerian custom, he will have 17 members of his family in the customs. So we have to be strategic. The only way to restructure is you can't restructure what you are not a part of. You can't clean a room when you're outside. You can only clean a room when you're inside. So we have to understand that and accept that we have trivialized those sensitive offices. And for us to catch up, we need to strategically look for a way to enter the place or tell our president to develop policies, let him do mass recruitment for Yorubas now. So that in seven or eight years' time, the generals that will be controlling the army too will be Yorubas. So we have to we have to be strategic. It's not something we can do overnight. We have to be strategic about it, and it's a long-term plan. Then restructuring. I also is a very brilliant and fantastic idea. I read um, um Abafemiola's autobiography some weeks back, a bit some months back, and I was amazed with what he achieved. Before I've just always been hearing about free education, free education. I do all did this, I will all did that. But when I read it with my own eyes in his book and I saw what he met on ground, how many secondary schools he met and primary schools, and it was deliberate. Even when he brought out policies then for free education, Nigerians criticized him when he increased the taxes. They were saying he's a bad person, he's a wicked person, he's this, he's that. But he had a vision and he, 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 followed, he followed his vision through. So what it simply means is that as a regional government, he achieved what no federal government has even achieved in those sectors. But the truth is that whether, you, whether we use regions or we use local government or use state government, if we have incompetent leaders, leaders who are only after driving the latest cars and traveling abroad and calling them my excellency, your excellency, the governor, the executive governor and all those titles, whether it's region or it's um, local government, it's will be garbage in, garbage out. They will not achieve anything. So what we should focus on is not whether we should go back to regional government or go back to this kind of government. It's not our problem in Nigeria. It's not about kind of government. Some people say LCDAs. Let us break down local government to LCDAs. The LCDAs now are even now worse. They cannot even do anything because the state government is taking all their money. So uh, I, kind of, we need, I agree we need to do restructuring in terms of devol de devolving more powers to other arms of government. But the major restructuring we should be focusing on, look at the fundamental mistake um, Labour Party made in, um, in Etiosa. 
Bank KW was running. Obanikoro was running. But it's just a guy. I really don't know anything much about him. Why couldn't they have brought in Pastor Sonny Enebi as their candidate in our as of rep for Etiosa? Will you not feel more comfortable if we have an Sonny Enebi or a Pastor Olu Victor as the as of rep member for Etiosa? I will, I will feel comfortable interacting with him and sharing ideas with him. But the person that was there, I don't know him. But you know the way Nigerians operate in the next election now, you will now have people that have polluted interest because they've seen that ah, we can ride on this way. Let us show interest. So they are not showing interest for genuine reason. So we have to be deliberate. So our, the major instruction we need now is that we need to go and head hunt. We need to tap our leaders. Tap young people who are smart. Even elderly people, talk to them. Pastor, why are you just staying in Trinity House, Trinity Church? Pastor, come to Abu Dhabi to come and head this BP agency. You are a chartered accountant. You have an accounting firm. So you can add value. Stop preaching alone. Come and add value in this regard. We need to convince ourselves. Yes, we know we'll lose money. We might not make money because a lot of those who want to perform are not going there to steal money. So they look like, ah, if I go to this government, are you sure I will not lose money in my business? That means I can't make money anymore. My lifestyle is this amount. We need to sacrifice for our country. If we don't sacrifice for our country, we are going to keep on complaining. So at some point, but the level of sacrifice will now have to vary. So the best form of restructuring is for us to identify our talents, both in Canada, in America, identify the smart ones. So once they say, pastor, give us three names to come and become head of an agency or something. Let's not recommend our children alone. You can give your child one, then the remaining two. Give people that you know that, that you don't even have a relationship with them, but you can trust their competence. That's the best form of restructuring. But if you change it, if you make some governors governor of regional government, they will finish it. If you make them local government chairman, they will finish it. If you make them president, they will finish it. So it's about the capacity of the leader. Thank you. So the second question, uh, there was uh, the second question. I think you answered oh, yes. the question. Minister of State. Minister of State. Yes. 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 The idea of Minister of State is lack of, you know, when, when you are empty to a particular level and you cannot reason and you, can, you are not creative enough, that's when you say you want to have a Minister of State for something. What does it mean? Even if the constitution says we must have a minister from every state and we must have 36 ministries, must you now create some names that don't make sense? You shouldn't. Look at what uh, Mr. Alua wrote to me said. He said we can have Ministry of Youth and Development and Entrepreneurial Development. Then we can have Minister of Ministry of Sports. Separate some ministries. In Ministry of Transport now, transport is so big. Aviation, maritime. Maritime deserves to have its own ministry on its own, stand alone. Because the Minister of Transport is extremely powerful. So you can develop the minister and say, okay, our constituents say we must have at least one minister. We need a minimum of 37 ministers. Then divide the ministries into 37 ministries with creative ideas that they can have real impact. Not that you are saying minister of, minister of, I have minister of power, minister of state for power. So who is the minister of state for power? Is he an advisor? What is his rate? He's a junior minister. What does he do? Junior minister is driving Range Rover Sports. Senior minister is driving g wagon But they are not doing anything in the same ministry. He's not achieving anything, but he's driving official car. But if you give him ministry of something, at least he can be responsible there and try and achieve something. But making him a junior minister, you are killing his creativity because he feels he cannot do anything. He's beholden to the minister of minister, the main minister. And even the civil servant, this is the ministry of state, he cannot do anything. I'm going to go and see the major minister. Just the same way our deputy governors are not usually relevant because they are beholden to the president, unless the governor determines to, to, to empower them by giving them responsibilities. So we need to be creative in coming up. I don't think I'll be disappointed if Tinubu maintains, um, President Tinubu maintains this minister of state for this. Even if I want to be a minister, I will not want to accept a minister of state for something because as far as I'm concerned, it's just a waste of time. So I, I don't know if I've answered the question very well, madam. Thank you so much. We have three hands up and uh, we're going to take those as the last three questions and then I'll end with my own as well. And so please, I'm going to ask uh, Mr. Benjamin, Omeze to please keep his comments or his question very brief. Then we also have uh, Mr. Bola Adetula and we have Prince Edem as well. So please go ahead, Mr. Benjamin, if you can keep it quick. Thank you. Okay, um, good evening. Um, Mr. Farouk, it's been a brilliant season. Um, just a quick one. Um, regarding the oral science report, um, what do you think are the major hurdles towards the adoption of that report? And um, secondly, do you um, see the possibility of this administration going ahead with that report? Okay. And so the next question would be from 
Mr. Bola Aditsula. Please go ahead with your question and then Prince Adam would be the last one. Well, thank you. I'm happy to inform you that I have not yet changed my gender. Although this oh, is sorry. <laughs> sorry. I am a beautiful and wonderful lady. So my apologies. I have not changed my gender at all. I'm Mrs. Adetula Ni Oshibodu. Mrs. Adetula. Now, yes, please. Um, thank you. I joined in late. My own problem is this. When Nigerians uh, occupy um, post at international level, most of them don't get encouragement from the home government. And this is very, very disturbing and sad. While I was in the African Union Commission, there was an organization that was just being set up, WADA, World Anti-Doping Agency. I did everything at ensuring that the regional office for Africa is brought to Nigeria. But the people in the Ministry of Sports didn't understand. Instead, they were blocking me, doing all sorts of things, thinking I was trying to make, imagine, and South Africa just quickly snatched it. That is one. Number two, the boss in Nigeria didn't know how I got the job. As soon as he got there and discovered that this is a woman, a Christian, a, 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 a Nadeko, or whatever, she must be brought back home to Nigeria. She wrote a horrible letter that she, he, I should be recalled. Of course, they called him to order. So all I'm just saying, let us continue to give encouragement, support, and whatever Nigerians that are abroad occupying international positions, especially the United Nations, African Union Commission, ECA, and so on. That is my Plea. And another thing, let us, who can help us tell the current, I mean, the new president, there must be somebody in his office who will be scouting around the world to look for vacancies. And then you get good, competent Nigerians, and there are many, and you lobby for that. Though. That is what they do in Togo, in so many West African countries. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mrs. Adetula, and apologies for trying to change your gender. Of, I apologize for that. Uh, I just saw the name and assumed it was a, a, a guy, so my apologies again. Uh, I'm going to have Prince Adam ask a question. 30 seconds or less, please. Yeah, I was in Nigeria recently, and I saw the way the roads looked. I saw how people were living, the homelessness, the unemployment and the poverty and the poverty and i want to change that and i sent a message to the african leadership group before i went to nigeria but i haven't gotten a response yet i sent all my information and i'm still waiting for a response from you guys and i'm 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 starting my own business in, in nigeria i'm currently in contact with with obasaki so what I need now is for the African leadership group to get involved in what I'm doing. Okay. Because I want to work with you guys as well. I want to help improve the lives of Nigerians all over Nigeria and not just in one part of Nigeria. I want to improve the quality of life, Im improve the standard of life, help fix the roads, help fix the infrastructure, help get things on the right track. Thank you. And with time, I know this is going to be a slow process and we don't want to make any mistakes. I'm willing to take as much time as possible and be as patient as possible. I want things to be done right and done in the right way. Thank you. Thank you for that. And apologies that we haven't reached out to you. We'll look at we'll look through the files again and then no get your contact Please take your and time. look at no what you're So apologies. Thank you so much for that. Um, you're welcome. Mr. Farouk, do you want to take those three questions or should I yes. add my questions to no, it? Let me take those three. Okay. Let me take those Thank three you. and add those as a closing. So, okay, the first question is um, ben, Mr. Benjamin, you talked about Oran Sayer's report and can this administration adopt the report? I think the reason why the, uh, the report has not been adopted, if I recall vividly, because it's been a while the report was made, is that they recommended merging of a lot of agencies because the report said that there is a lot of duplication of agencies of government, agency doing the same thing, you know, some agencies, you only hear them when it's time for budget. 
but in terms of the real activity they are doing, we don't know space agencies, so many agencies that nobody knows the impact in the society. So that's why they haven't implemented. And you know, these agencies are headed by governments and politicians, government officials, their aides, their friends, that they just want to empower, you know, and all that. So they might be reluctant. And it goes to leadership. But if you have a serious government, I believe that the I, I believe the president will look into that because one of the things the president needs to look into is he needs to ensure that the civil service is rejigged. Ministries achieve the purpose which they are set up for. You want to apply for COO, you want to apply for governor's consent. You can for the past one year now, we have some governor's consent we have been processing in Lagos State, and we've not gotten a headway. Minister's consent to in, in the Ministry of Works, Ministry of Housing, we want to get a um, governor's minister's consent, and we've not gotten for almost seven, eight months. It shouldn't be so. We are not we are not encouraging development in the country. So people want to build houses in Lagos, they need all these their documents, they are not getting their documents, they're, everything is slow. So they need to reject the ministries. They need to adopt the report. I believe that Tinubu will want to work. Because President Tinubu, I have a lot of regard for him because he's a, he's, a, he's a tinker. And when somebody is a tinker and surrounds himself with brilliant people, I always respect them regardless of their affiliations or political affiliations or what have you. So I believe it's something they will consider. You know. So I, I, I believe they will consider that. Then Mrs. Bola Adetula said, Nigerians abroad don't get encouragement. Madam, it's not only Nigerians abroad. I've, I've had people who say they want to contribute something to a school, a, a secondary school, and the principal said, no, we're not going to allow you. That we, are, we must be the one to do it. Somebody wants to tie a road in Oshu State. I'm aware that there was a time the Adelikis wanted to tie the road to their university, and the state government did not allow them to tie the road. So in Nigeria, is the quality of leadership. When you have poor, myopic leaders abroad, foreigners and people who are in America, they, they, they endow professorial chairs. They donate monies to these universities. They make grants in their will, they make grants. We don't have that in Nigeria. So why would you want to bring an agency to the government to Nigeria and they are fighting against it? Why they are fighting against it is that they are used to rent seeking opportunities. They want to collect money. Anything where they will not benefit directly, they will not approve it. So if you tell them that, okay, I want to build a school for you now, but you will be the one to bring the contractor, they will allow you. But if you say, I will bring my contractor and all those things, they won't allow you. It goes to quality of leadership. If I'm the head of a school, or I'm, an, I'm the head of an agency, and somebody says you want to do something to, I will even go and look for people to come and help the government. I will be calling all of you. Dangote, come and build this road. You come and do this thing. Do, bring the contractor. I don't need anybody. I don't need anything from you. All I need is for you to deliver the project, but I will come and inaugurate the project, and I will claim it as part of my achievement when I was in government. So if we have good leaders, they would consider that. And you say you need encouragement. Yes, we have to commend you. Nigerians, we don't like to commend or encourage ourselves. We have that very toxic nature of bringing down, bring that. But it's, in terms of our leadership, is in terms of the quality of leadership. If we have good leaders; they would, they would do that. And you talked about Tinubu having recruit, recruiters abroad, everywhere. If I know him very well, I think he's doing that already. Because I read a story about Amzat, um, the deputy governor of Lagos. I watched his interview. He said he met President Tinubu in America. Maybe they came for a meeting, and President Tinubu asked him that, "Where are you from? You are from Nigeria." Please come back to Lagos. And that was how he was wanted to become a special advisor. We have Badabia Amila, he was brought from America. I know a couple of people in Tinubu's, Tinubu's kitchen cabinet. He brought them from abroad to come and work in his government. So I know that if, if someone like Tinubu could meet Amzat in a meeting and he, he pushed him, you are sure that these kind of guys they will be going everywhere to go and be scouting, to go and be scouting for people. And look at the youth leader they used for APC. They told them to go and bring a youth leader. When PDP chose their youth leader, they said he was 25 years old, 27 years old. I went to go and Google him to see what he has achieved. I could not find anything. I could not see national youth leader of PDP. I could not see what he has done before. I did not see one single thing, not even a write-up, not even that he went for a conference. I didn't see anything online. But when I saw Dio Israel, I said, I've been hearing his name. Who is this guy? And when I went to read up on him, I was wowed. I was blown away that, wow, this guy is national youth leader. This is a very good appointment. Look at the national women leader they chose again. A medical doctor, a young person. So... We have an idea that these guys will go after people that know what they are doing. Because if you look around, people around them, a lot, a couple of them are very, very solid people. Then um, Prince Edmond, yeah, Prince Edmond, what you said is very, is a very, is very good. If all Nigerians were like you, the country would be better. Just two days ago, when I was in my mosque where I pray in my estate, they told us that uh, somebody is sponsoring our imam to go to Saudi Arabia for Hajj, and we should all contribute money for him to take when he's going. And I told them, I said, I can never contribute to that kind of money. The Quran says you only go to Hajj when you can afford it. I have people in my village who need mattress, who need food to eat. My conch, I won't sleep well if I contribute money for someone to go to Hajj when people in my village are asking me for money and I'm not giving them money for school fees or money to buy textbook for their children. So I told them, up, I said, I will not be a part of this. 
If you want to take money from the Musk account, you can go ahead. But don't expect me to contribute money for someone to go for Hajj. For what basis? The Quran is clear. If you cannot afford it, you don't go for it. So we all have to look for a way to give back. Even if it's a child, that's why I like Soludo. When Soludo became president, governor of Anambra, he said he used to buy primary school, use school uniform, he used to pay for people's school fees, he did table and change at university. Those are the kind of stories I like to hear. When you contribute to the society, God will always bless you one way or the other. But if you just keep all your money for you and your children and you die, your children squander the money having party, they want to bury their father with a casket of 17 millionaire, you go and buy a place to bury your parents for 35 millionaire. Meanwhile, in your village, you have people in your family that are hungry, that they are not going to good schools and you are not helping them. So we need to imbibe this spirit of giving back to the society. If all of us can make up our minds today that I will adopt just one child in my village, it doesn't cost much to train people in the villages. Nigeria will be a better country, but most of us just buying G-Wagon, less class, this one, iPhone 17, Nokia Ds. Everybody's using expensive phones, but their family members are not taking care of them. So Mr. Edmond, I commend you. I hope that you, are, you, you really mean what you are saying. And I'm sure that if you are very, if you really mean it, I'm sure ALJ will partner with you. And please spread it around. Don't just take it to one community. Go to the hinterland. Don't focus in Lagos. Go to Oshun State. Go to Ekiti State. Go to all those far places. Go to Southern Kaduna, where people are remote. Don't be doing all your charity in Lagos. Lagos. People in Lagos are not suffering. They are all wealthy and rich people. Even the people that claim they don't have money, they are still wealthy. If you go to the villages, you know that they, they you understand what they call poverty. So, madam, you can answer your question. You can ask your question now. Thank you. I, I think you've answered um, my question in part uh, throughout the uh, the conversation, but I would just like if you could summarize for me, um, because you started to talk about like watchdog and what we as citizens can do. And it's so typical of us, we're looking to the administration, what is our expectation? But I, I want us to take some practical lessons or action that we as citizens can do. Uh, with this new administration, you started to talk about writing letters of, um, I, I don't want to call it grievances, but like making the case, collecting information and sending it to our local government. So if you can just itemize for us that as watchdogs or working with watchdog organization, as a citizen, this is what I should be doing uh, to help move this administration forward, to help hold this uh, administration accountable, to, to demand fiscal responsibility. What can we as Nigerian citizens be doing instead of sitting back and just thinking that we have no role in all of this? Thank you very much, madam. That's a very brilliant question. What are we supposed to be doing as citizens? I'll cite an example to you, um, for you. Um, the ADC candidates that ran for governor in Lagos, I can't remember his name. Um, oh, I can't remember his name. In this 2023 election, I saw a letter he wrote recently about how the Lagos State government was applying for a loan and he analyzed the letter critically. That's a form of something we can do. About some days ago, I have a friend who is a member elect of the House of Assembly, Honorable Adewale and he will be inaugurated next week, Tuesday. And I was watching the news last week and I saw in, in, on TVC, they wrote on those state house of assembly passes 64 bills in four years. And I took a picture and sent it to him on WhatsApp. I said, can you see 64 bills? You said you want to have 50 bills in four years. 50 bills is small. If you have a member of house of assembly, I have a my member, for my, my member elect for my state house of assembly. I know him. When he gets inaugurated, I will find out how many times he spoke on the parliament. I will find out how many motions he moved, how many bills he passed into law. And if he didn't perform, I will be asking him, I will allowances. What my house of rep guy, my house of rep member elect now is going for a second time on a Rebam Salam. He performed fantastically well. I told him in my community, we have a village that they need water. He did a borrow for them. I said, we need street light. He gave us street light. He gave some people scholarship. He said he would do some roads for us. He has been bringing projects for us. We tell him, I reach out to him. Then if I reach out to you and you don't answer, when you are going for campaign, you can go to that his campaign, right on Facebook, go to their wall, go to that. Some of them, words get to them. They all have Facebook profile. Go and write there, my honorable. For the past three weeks, my road has been bad. I sent you a text message. You did not respond. Is this how you plan to continue to govern? You continue to send them emails. You send them emails. Go to their Instagram, comment there. By the time he sees your name, he will say, ah, Jimoke 80. This man sent me an email two weeks ago. Now he will just call you, madam. Okay, what is it? We have to put them on their toes. But if we don't call them or check up on them, the phone calls they receive is for money. Ah, honorable. Yeah, I want to be more... I want to pay for CS for my wife. I want to pay for rent. That's the phone calls they receive. If you ask them for something tangible, they will listen to you. And they don't listen to you. Write them letters. Send them email. Newspaper, the nation newspaper, all the newspapers, they have columns where they write. You can say, we are, are we practicing a democracy? I have a member of the House of Rep. I sent him an email on June 1, on June 10, on June 17. 
asking for our road. He has not done any, any zona, any town hall meeting. Is this how you want to continue to rule? This is not what has been done in America. He will respond to you. Or go on or, or, or put a comment when they have radio program and they say phone in. Nigerians will be phoning in on a love program. When they're having a love program about girlfriend, how your girlfriend has left you, they will be calling in on a radio program. For Nigerian, for a radio program, they say call in on something. You will be monitoring their movement. If they go somewhere, you go and meet them. Some people travel, some Muslims travel to Saudi Arabia. If they hear that Buhari is going to Saudi Arabia, they will go for Umrah. They don't want to go and worship God. They just want to go and meet with the president. So they know how to go and attack. So if you see them, give them pressure, call them. They are very scared of us. Politicians are very scared. I relate with a lot of them. They cannot stand pressure of you asking them questions. By the time you write, ask, make noise about them two or three times, they will look for you and they will come and solve that problem. But Nigerians, we don't believe in accountable, holding somebody accountable because in the first place, you didn't even vote for him. In the first place, you didn't even have a PVC. So you do, you feel that just typing an email or four line might be a lot of work for you. But we have to put them on their toes. If they know we'll put them on their toes. Look at Governor Somolu. Nigerians were shouting that they wanted to vote for somebody else. When he saw that Tinubu lost Lagos State, he woke up and he was going around. He went for that. He, he's not moving. You could see the, the, all the ministers, all the commissioners were calling meetings in the ministry. Ah, please, oh, these people, how do we do? Let her come and help us. They will say, one well, my friend, the civil servant, she said, if she greets her director, he doesn't answer her. But now they, have, they, they are now humble because they saw that the people reacted. So we have to ask questions. If they don't listen to us, four years will soon be here. And when you now start campaigning, campaign for somebody else. Now say, I want you to vote for this person because our house assembly member, he has been there for four years. He has been collecting salary. When he joined government, he didn't have a car. Now he's driving Lexus. Before he didn't have a house. He didn't used to go to America before. Now he has started traveling up and down. What has he done for you in this community? If you, if you put something up, some of them are so gullible that they will even travel to London for holiday and they put it on Facebook with state money. Meanwhile, they are not doing anything in their community. Save all those things. When it's time for campaign, do adverts in paper. All your money they are donating, put it in paper. Look at who is contesting for second term. What has he done? Now put picture of him and his girlfriends and his wife in London, America. Now put picture of the road of his village and all those things. They are scared. You have to face them. When you face them, they will comport. But Nigerians don't face them. We give up easily and say, I'll leave it to the hands of God. I'll pray to my God. I serve a living father. I serve a living God. I'm respecting my own miracle. I'm going to Canada. That's what is affecting us. But if you start asking questions, they will sit up. Thank you so much for that. Maybe we can work with you to develop a template of maybe list right. of emails, because I know here in the US, we send emails to our representatives if we have uh, issues. So maybe that's one of the things that we need to develop. How can we invite them to town hall meetings, demand for like uh, response to our questions and things like that. So maybe we can follow up with you and see if we can help develop that accountability or transparency uh, checklist that we as citizens can take on to do. So thank you so sure. very much. I really appreciate your time. I'm going to hand over back to Mr. President uh, for the closing remark. Thank you, sir. You're welcome, madam. Nice to be here. Well, um, Abbas, you've done very well. I have only one Thank problem you. with you. You want me to become a politician. So that's my quarrel with you. So we'll meet ourselves in the political ring. <laughs> but you've spoken well. Very brilliant. Very, very brilliant. Very, very passionate very enthusiastic and i think politically you are going to go far Amen, God's sir. Grace and god will help you and your generation we've taken everything you've you have on board like uh, jim okay says we're going to reach out to you to develop a template to see how we can develop nigeria further and um, see the differences that we can make so let me thank you very much let me <coughs> thank your wife for giving you the time to to be here I think you made an allusion to her. I hope you are giving her very good housekeeping allowance. I am not just uh, <laughs> sending her to the market. <laughs> uh, God bless Complain you. Let's I, need to, I need to increase it. You need to increase like, it. <laughs> everything is going up. So. <laughs> Maybe after you bought one or two more G wagons, you would increase the house allowance. <laughs> And I pray your mother won't be angry. Your alpha won't be angry with you that she didn't send him to Mecca. You know, but it's all <laughs> good. Yeah. Well, me, whether you like it or not, you send me to Jerusalem. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Thank you so much, Farouk. The Lord bless you. The Lord keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious Amen. unto you in Jesus' mighty name. Yeah, you can Thank see you, clapping for you. She's quite happy. Yeah. with today's session. Thank you so much. So we'll catch up. Yeah.
We pray Nigeria will be okay. Uh, you have very a lot of confidence in uh, Ashiwaju. Um, please do your best to support him, uh, and he needs all the help that he can get right now. Thank you so much. God bless you all. Thank you all for being on the program. Uh, we've put something on the platform, different responses here and there. So if you have anything to add to that, to put into that, please do so. See you same time, same time next week, five o'clock on Thursday. God will be here, we will be here, and Nigeria will be present. God bless you all, and thank you very much. Sonny, thank, thank you. you Joel, thank you. Noyo, thank you. Thank you very much, Bambo. As always, great to see you on the platform. God be with you, and God keep you. Fulayo, thank you. Ah, my brother, Kaude, thank you so much. And thank you for what you did in Trinity House a couple of weeks, a couple of Sundays ago. We're very grateful. Ayodeji, thank you. Idua Kleya, thank you very much. God bless you. Afalabi, we didn't hear your voice today, but we thank you. Bolade, thank you. Uh, God bless you all. Uluaro Timi, thank you very much. Bola Shiboju, thank you. Small voice becoming a big woman, thank you. Toli Godalo, my sister, thank you. Adiola Mikule, thank you very much. I to us, great, great. Lara, thank you so much. Tuyo the Tuyo, thank you. Tom, 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 Tomero, thank you. Shex, thank you very, very much. Femi Akitude, thank you. Princess Olu, thank you very much. Cyprian, thank you. Ah, Cyprian, Kedu, how are you? Long time. Olalekon, thank you. Rosemary, thank you very much. Shegu Imano, Tujometa, thank you so, so much. Uh, we are grateful to God for all that he has done. Uh, Auntie Jimoke, thank you very much. And uh, by God's grace, we'll be having Mr. Ayo Ainife next week, next week. Uh, and he'll be telling us a lot about how he sees Nigeria and what Nigeria is doing, Mr. Ayo Ainife. God will be with you all. My sister Ekwe, the great Ekwe of Aqua Ibom, thank you so much. Uh, nice talking to you yesterday. God bless you. Abiola Sapo. Thank you. We have a video announcement concerning who's coming next week. So we're going to play that very quickly. Adam, how are you? Long time. God bless you. Greet my people for me. Femi Koka Jones. God bless you. Play the video and then I sign off. Thank you very much. Bye bye. which holds every Thursday, 5 p.m. West African time, same Zoom link as displayed on your screen. To help curb hackers, kindly rename yourself if you enter the platform with the name of a device. We ask that you keep your comments in the chat kind and respectful. We do not condone violent, abusive, or divisive language of any kind. Help disseminate the weekly flyer to your contacts and social media handles and subscribe to the YouTube channel displayed on your screen. If you are interested in engaging with ALG, please complete the form displayed on your screen. ALG School of Leadership and Governance, SOLAG, will launch its Citizens Responsibility course in June 2023. To register and attend the course, please complete the form displayed on your screen. Please support ALG's Nigeria Sacrificial Fund, created to raise funds for the development and execution of ALG's The Nigeria Project Challenge, grouped into the following 10 components. RLN, Right Leadership in Nigeria. CR2N, Constitution Review and Restructuring Nigeria. MBCE, Nation Building, Enlightenment and Citizen Empowerment. PRDU, Peace, Reconciliation, Dialogue and Unity. CEOOSC, Championing Education and Out-of-School Children. TAAC, Transparency, Accountability and Anti-Corruption. TAEP, Transparent, Accountable Electoral Processes. WINB, Women in Nation Building. YEP, Youth Empowerment for Nation Building. LOGROD, 
local government resource opportunity development and send your sacrificial contributions to the account information displayed on your screen. Please note that ALG runs a transparent account system and will provide quarterly reports on all funds received and expended. For more information on ALG, please visit the website at www.africaleadershipgroup.org. You can also send an email to membership at africaleadershipgroup.org or call 0703-187-1514. Please check out ALG's social media handles on LinkedIn and Instagram with the handles displayed on your screen. Thank you. Hello, Pastor. We are yes. done, sir. We are done. Very good. Very well done. God bless you all. Have a fantastic weekend. Bye bye. <laughs> Uh, please, if Prince Adam is there, can you please um, send your number across again? Ojimoke, you have his contact? Yes, 